our committee will come to order. 220 years ago, one of our founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, warned that the imprisonment of individuals in distant or unknown locations without due process is a very dangerous engine of arbitrary government. To guard against the tendencies of such governments, Hamilton advocated for the centuries-old power of British courts to order wardens to bring prisoners before it so that a judge as a neutral third party could inquire into the basis for continued det detention. This is the power of habeas corpus, or what became known as the Great Writ. The Military Commissions Act 2006, which was enacted in the last Congress, stripped our federal courts of this bulwark of our, of our Constitution. As a result, the administration received the green light to be jailer, judge, and jury, and it gladly revved its engine. The engine roared until the highest court in our land determined that the price of fuel for that engine was more than our Constitution could bear. Last month, the Supreme Court, in a five to four opinion, decided that the detainees who are being held at the U.S. Navy station in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, do have the habeas corpus privilege under the suspension clause of the Constitution, and that Section 7 of the Military Commissions Act is unconstitutional. As a former prosecutor, it's gratifying to know that the federal courts will resume their traditional role of ensuring that only the corrupt remain behind bars. While I still believe the current military commission system has some other significant weaknesses, this ruling of the court will help by ensuring that any commission ruling which are designed to bring terrorists to justice can better withstand judicial scrutiny. For certain convictions must go hand in hand with tough prosecution. In addition to the now largely addressed habeas issue, I have repeatedly identified six other potential unlawful defects in the current military commission's framework. First, the Military Commissions Act may violate the exceptions clause to under Article Three of the Constitution by impermissibly restricting the Supreme Court's review. Second, it's questionable whether the Supreme Court would uphold a system that purports to make the president the final arbiter of the Geneva Convention. Third, the provisions regarding coerced testimony may be challenged under our Constitution. Fourth, the Act contains very lenient hearsay rules which rub up against the right of the accused to confront witnesses and evidence as guaranteed by the Constitution. And fifth, the Act may be challenged on equal protection and other constitutional grounds for how it discriminates against the detainees for being aliens. Last, Article I of the Constitution prohibits ex post facto laws, and that is what this act may have created. Although I don't anticipate that all these issues will be resolved before high-value detainees, uh, such as uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the self-confessed mastermind of 9-11, go to trial, I have confidence that the courts, and we here in our Congress, will be liberal be deliberate and decisive rather than recklessly headstrong in how we approach these very difficult questions. We must make sure that the verdicts of the military juries stick. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. We have as our witnesses in, in, in front of us, where did that do? Stephen Oleski and his partner in Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Dorr and is representing six Bosnian Algerian men who have been detained at Guantanamo since 2002. Mr. Oleski was awarded to the 2007 American Bar Association Pro Bono Public Corps Award largely because of his work on habeas corpus. Would you raise your hand? We'll know who's who. There you are. Thank you very much. Next witness, Neil Katyal, is a Saunders professional in national security law at Georgetown University Law School. In Hammond versus Rumsfeld, he successfully argued before the Supreme Court that the Military Commissions Act, which predated the Military Commissions Act, uh, were unconstitutional. Would you raise your hand, Sir Thank you. Richard Klinger, 
who served as the National Security Council's general counsel and legal advisor from 2006 to 2007. He is a partner in the law firm of Sidley Austin. Thank you. Mr. Morris Davis, Colonel of the United States Air Force, although he's testifying as a civilian while on terminal leave. Colonel Davis was formerly the chief prosecutor for the Office of Military Convention. Commissioners, we certainly appreciate you being with us and giving us uh, your thoughts on this highly important issue. Ranking Member Duncan Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for uh, for holding this important hearing. And uh, I would simply note that uh, that uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, however, never recommended that habeas uh, be given to prisoners of war. In fact, uh, uh, the habeas rights that have been uh, uh, have been uh, uh, directed by the court's decision are rights that uh, that uh, terrorists have at this point, which no American soldiers have. Uh, over the last couple of years, this committee has uh, spent a lot of time focusing on the, our detainee policy for the global war on terrorism. And the policy that the committee advanced uh, took into account that this war against terror has produced a new type of battlefield and a new type of enemy. In the last Congress, we worked hard to pass the Detainee Treatment Act uh, and the Military Commissions Act, uh, MCA, ensuring that the United States is able to detain, interrogate, and try terrorists. We had a practical problem that we had to address. Uh, this new type of war that doesn't involve uh, particularly uniformed uh, uh, adversaries on the battlefield, but nonetheless very deadly adversaries. And we had to do so in a manner that is consistent with the Constitution and the international rules of war. As the Attorney General recently remarked about the DTA and the MCA, uh, the Detainee Treatment Act and the Military Commissions Act, and he said, and I quote, these laws give more procedural protections than the United States or any other country for that matter had ever given to wartime captives, whether those captives were lawful soldiers in foreign armies or unlawful combatants who target civilians and hide in civilian populations. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, I asked, just asked the staff as we kick this thing off uh, to give me the list of procedural protections that we gave uh, to accused terrorists when we put this bill together. Let me just go over these because I think this is important. The right to counsel. None of our POWs have that. The presumption of innocence. POWs don't have that. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Opportunity to obtain witnesses and other evidence. Right to discovery. Exculpatory evidence provided by de to defense counsel. Statements obtained through torture are excluded. Classified evidence must be declassified, redacted, or summarized to the maximum extent possible. Statements allegedly obtained through coercion are only admissible if the military judge rules that the statement is reliable and probative. A certified impartial judge will preside over all proceedings of individual military commission. The U.S. government must provide defense counsel including counsel with the necessary clearances to review classified information on the accused terrorists they have. In capital cases, the Military Commission's 12 panelists must unanimously agree on the verdict, and the President has a final review. Panel votes are secret ballot, which ensures panelists are allowed to vote their own conscience. Right to appeal to a new military, a new court of Military Commission's review and the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and the right against double jeopardy. Uh, those gentlemen were derived from, the, uh, from our scrutiny of other uh, councils that were, uh, that were similar, tribunals including uh, Nuremberg, Rwanda, and others. And I think you could, you could uh, accurately say that we actually gave more rights to accused terrorists than any councils, uh, any uh, uh, tribunals ever assembled. If you've got some others that give more rights uh, to accused terrorists, I'd like to hear about it. And if you don't think that list of rights uh, is long enough, I'd like to know what you think we should, uh, what additional rights we should give. And once again, uh, the right to habeas is a right that no American soldier enjoys. Um, this is a delicate and carefully balanced framework agreed to by the large majorities in both houses of Congress and was thrown into question as a result of the recent Supreme Court decision in Boumediene 
uh, and in a deeply divided opinion, a 5-4 majority made the unprecedented decision to afford a constitutional right of habeas corpus on alien enemies detained abroad by our military forces in the course of an ongoing war. And while I disagree with the court's opinion, the decision is now the law of the land. The challenge before the committee today is clarifying the implications of the Supreme Court decision. Although some of our panelists today advance the argument that the Supreme Court decision suggests other constitutional infirmities with the Military Commissions Act that warrant congressional action, I continue to believe that absent an explicit decision by the court that the commission's process is unconstitutional, the trial should go forward without congressional interference. It's important to note that the majority in Boumediene addressed the process for status determinations regarding detention. The court was silent with respect to commissions. Currently, there are 20 commissions in the works, and the first trial has just commenced. Under the MCA, each of the accused will have the right to appeal a guilty verdict to the Court of Military Commission Review, to the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Court Circuit, uh, and then to the Supreme Court. I encourage the committee to heed the underlying principle of Chief Justice Roberts' dissent in Boumediene. We should not rush to judgment on the constitutionality of the commissions until the process is complete and the trials have exhausted their reviews. As we meet today, the case against the 9-11 conspirators is moving forward. As the Congress intended, the U.S. is in the process of bringing those responsible for the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon to justice. Congress should exercise discretion. While Boumediene did not reach the issue of military commissions directly, it did raise a host of issues related to the process required to detain an individual the military believes to be a terrorist. Moreover, the basis for which the court determined that detainees in Guantanamo have a constitutional right raises questions as to whether the court's rationale could extend to other places where the military holds detainees, like Iraq and Afghanistan. I share Justice Scalia's concern that absent congressional action, the policy for handling enemy prisoners in this war will ultimately lie with the branch that knows the least about the national security concerns the subject entails. I believe these are matters best left to political branches to decide. So what policy matters are put into question by Boumediene that should not be left to the court to decide? Attorney General Mukasey's recent, recent speech on the subject highlights six critical areas that need congressional action. First and most important, Congress should make clear that a federal court may not order the government to bring enemy combatants into the United States. Even under the current system, we've released detainees that have resurfaced on the battlefield and engaged in armed conflict. I share Justice Scalia's concern that post Boumediene, the number of enemy return to combat will increase. And I remind my colleagues that, uh, that we have had a number of people who were released from Guantanamo who showed up on the battlefield again attempting to kill American soldiers. Uh, second, it's imperative that the proceedings for these enemy combatants be conducted in a way that protects how our nation gathers intelligence and what that intelligence is. Attorney General Mukasey cites a terrorism case he presided over when he sat on the federal bench where the government was required by law to hand over to the defense a list of unindicted co-conspirators. This list found its way through the lawyers to, its, to Osama bin Laden in Khartoum. Third, Congress should make clear that habeas proceedings should not delay the military commission trials of detainees charged with war crimes. Fortunately, one federal judge has already ruled on this matter, deciding that the trial should go forward, but this question is still at issue. The victims of September 11 should not have to wait any longer to see those who stand accused face trial. That's what he said. Uh, fourth, Congress should reaffirm that for the duration of the conflict, the United States may detain as enemy combatants those who have engaged in hostilities or purposefully supported al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated organizations. Large majorities of this Congress support supplemental spending bills that pay for the war and allow for the continued fight against al-Qaeda. 
yet there are judges who question whether there are still authorization to detain we should put any doubt to rest fifth congress should ensure that one district court takes exclusive jurisdiction over these hay vs cases and should direct that common legal issues be decided by one judge in a coordinated fashion it is simply absurd to have the rules of the game change from one detainees case to the next last congress should make clear that the detainees cannot pursue other forms of litigation to challenge their condition their detention simply put detainees should not have two bites at the apple now that they will receive hay vs review there is no reason for the d c circuit to review status determinations also at stake here is whether this congress and this committee in particular will allow the so slow creep of lawfare to replace warfare our men and women in uniform are trained in armed conflict the battlefield is not a place for a crime scene investigative unit and i can recall mr chairman when we had our our one of our hearings on the uh, proposed detainee treatment act and we asked one of our uh, one of our very experienced litigators, uh, one of our lawyers and service lawyers who understood the UCMJ, and a number of people were saying, let's apply the UCMJ to uh, detainees on the battlefield. And we asked that particular uh, attorney whether that would mean that when a Marine squad saw a terrorist shoot at him on the battlefield in Afghanistan, he would then have to give him his Miranda rights uh, as he interrogated him at the uh, at the Humvee and the answer was in that lawyer's opinion yes he would have to do that uh, leading to the question of whether we were going to be able to assign lawyers to each uh, squad of marine combatants uh, so I think this is a uh, uh, this is an issue that we should uh, look at very clearly from the perspective of people on the battlefield uh, as the Attorney General recently argued military personnel should not be required to risk their lives to create the sort of arrest reports and chain of custody reports that are used under very different circumstances by ordinary law enforcement officers in the United States. Battlefields are not an environment where such reports can be generated without substantial risk to American lives. Uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, it's the battlefield that this committee needs to keep in mind here. We are the Armed Services Committee. Uh, we protect members of the armed services and try to make sure we have policies that allow them to execute their very difficult mission uh, with a modicum of safety. Uh, my greatest concern in light of this recent Supreme Court decision is its potential effect on operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. We detain thousands of detainees in Iraq and hundreds in Afghanistan. Detention is a fundamental component of warfare. It keeps combatants off the battlefield and provides actionable intelligence. We can't hamper our warfighters by providing them with the perilous choice of releasing detainees or complying with process requirements of the criminal justice system that are impossible to comply with on the battlefield. In the past, I would have thought such a concern was remote, bordering on paranoia. However, as we meet today, detainees in Afghanistan have filed petitions for habeas relief in U.S. courts. As one editorialist recently pointed out, the Supreme Court rejected the concept that court jurisdiction is limited to sovereign American territory and could extend not just to captives at Guantanamo, but all detainees abroad. And I think this is simply untenable. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for holding this uh, very important hearing today. Uh, I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. Thank the gentleman. We are uh, extremely fortunate to have the uh, witnesses uh, we have on this panel, and we look forward to hearing from you. I, I hope I don't mispronounce your name as, as I, I call on, but let me try. Stephen Oleski. Did I get it? All right. Uh, get the. Get the uh, yes, you did, Mr. Chairman. Thank okay, you. Okay. With, with that, we will call on you first. Are we. I uh, hope you will summarize your testimony. Uh, we on the committee are uh, governed, as you know, by the five-minute rule, and we will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Hunter, members of the committee. I, I have been, since July 2004, co-lead counsel in the case which the Supreme Court decided on June 12th, Boumediene against Bush. My clients, as the chairman mentioned, were arrested uh, at the behest of the United States in Bosnia in the fall of 2001, uh, despite the fact that the Bosnians had Could no evidence. you get evidence, just a little closer to the microphone? Despite the fact that the Bosnians had no evidence 
to to arrest them were investigated thoroughly by the bosnian system of the cooperation of the united states and then ordered released in january two thousand and two however instead of being released they were turned over again at the demand the united states to our forces they are in flown to guantanamo where they've been since january twenty two thousand and two so they're now completing six and a half years in guantanamo without charge or hearing our case was originally dismissed in january of two thousand two another parallel case was ordered to go forward both cases then went up through the appellate system while that was happening this congress the previous congresses passed first the detainee treatment act of two thousand five and then the military commissions act of two thousand six both of which you've referred to in your opening remarks then in two thousand six the supreme court held in the hamdan case that uh, habeas had not been stripped or taken away by the detainee treatment act and habeas could go forward thereafter the congress passed the military commissions act which dealt both with military commissions and with the status of habeas corpus for the detainees in Guantanamo who had been characterized as enemy combatants. Uh, and that, that law appeared to say on its face that there could, be, there could be no habeas corpus rights to be pursued by men designated as enemy combatants through the Military Combat Status Review Tribunal or CSRT. Uh, design which was established in 2004. Our, our clients and others then challenged that habeas stripping provision uh, both in the circuit court and in the court of and in the United States Supreme Court resulting in the Bermidian decision of uh, June of June 12th. Uh, in the, that decision holds for the first time that uh, Congress has unlawfully suspended the writ of habeas corpus provided in Article I, Clause 9 of the Constitution because in the circumstances existing in Guantanamo, the court found that habeas rights ran there and could be invoked by those prisoners, a, a decision that was foreshadowed in the Ra Rasul and Hamdi decisions of 2004, also by the Supreme Court. Now, the suspension clause states that the privilege of, writ of, of the writ of habeas corpus may not be suspended except when in times of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. That's bedrock. It's in the body of the Constitution. It was so important to the founders that they didn't wait for a Bill of Rights. They put it as a limitation on the power of the executive and of the Congress right in the body of the Constitution. The Supreme Court then found in Bermidian that prisoners could claim habeas corpus despite the fact the Cuban government retains legal sovereignty over the United States base there because the United States has had total control and jurisdiction over that 45-mile enclave since the lease of 1903 under which we obtained the right in perpetuity to hold uh, that base as a military facility for the United States. Supreme Court also found that the prisoner's alien or foreign status was not a bar to their invoking habeas corpus in the context of Guantanamo. In view of the framers' intent in enshrining, enshrining habeas corpus in the body of the Constitution and the Supreme Court's history of construing some fundamental constitutional rights as applying outside the United States depending on particular facts and circumstances. That's a history that goes back over 100 years. Since there was no congressional finding in, this, in these cases of rebellion or invasion, the Supreme Court concluded there was no lawful basis for Congress to suspend habeas corpus for the approximately 275 men remaining in Guantanamo. Then the court examined whether the, pro the statutes that you enacted, particularly the Detainee Treatment Act and the habeas stripping provision of the Military Commissions Act of 2006 together provided an adequate substitute or an acceptable uh, remedy for habeas, which it found had been, had been stripped. The court found that these uh, congressional remedies were not adequate substitutes because the underlying process in Guantanamo, unlike a trial in 
federal court a criminal trial or another adversarial proceeding was fundamentally not adversarial there was no evidence no classified evidence made available to anyone they had to defend himself no one had lawyers they had limited ability to call witnesses and offer documents and the government evidence was presumed valid the only review that congress allowed of this was a limited review an administrative review essentially a record review by the court of appeals in washington which could not make new fact finding unlike a federal habeas court which could not go beyond the record from guantanamo which was this extremely non-adversarial record that resulted from a process created by the defense department in 2004. in effect the court of appeals would be reviewing a baked in record with many procedural deficiencies that the court found would not begin to provide anything approximating approximating fair or due process for example there'd be no ability to to challenge the legal authorization for detention which the administration has always asserted is found in the authorization for use of military force resolution of congress in september of uh, 2001. there's no authority in the district court to order conditional release of any prisoner found to be entitled to the grant of habeas corpus a federal district court can order a conditional release I say that release is conditional because that's the word the Supreme Court used and what the court was saying was that even if someone's ordered released it's still up to the political branches in this case the executive to negotiate their return to the country from which they were taken or to some other country which is willing to take them and as the committee may be aware there are a number of men who the Defense Department itself has cleared has said are not enemy combatants or no longer enemy combatants who are awaiting in Guantanamo for some country to be willing to take them United States has said properly that no one will be sent back at this time to a country where it be will be tortured or mistreated for example the Chinese Uyghurs were not willing to return to Chinese for that to China for that reason so they are actually uh, being held many of them as cleared men but uh, with no place to go so those are the deficiencies that the Supreme Court found in the uh, existing process and why it found that the circuit court process for limited review that Congress enacted was not sufficient in view of the constitutional entitlement of these men to some fair process it is correct that the Supreme Court left various details about how the habeas trials would be conducted to the federal district court in Washington right down the street in the Prettyman courthouse uh, but this result that the ex that experienced Article Three federal judges uh, sitting in the trial court will now do their jobs and conduct habeas trials is unremarkable and scarcely a justification, let alone one rising to a necessity for additional con congressional action with respect to habeas corpus at this time. Former Chief Judge Hogan is presiding over the bulk of those cases which are before him on remand from the Supreme Court in the short time since uh, June 12th. He's had a number of hearings, has uh, had briefings, and has begun to issue orders. The balance of the cases are before Judge Richard Leon, including my case. He has also held a number of hearings, uh, is beginning to issue orders, and has stated publicly that he intends to have all the cases before him involving approximately 25 prisoners completely resolved uh, and uh, final orders issued by the end of calendar uh, 2008. Both those judges are consulting closely. They have assured us in meeting the Supreme Court's mandate to move these cases expeditiously. These cases are heavily fact intensive and in my view would be difficult for Congress to weigh in on with respect to habeas at this time because the facts and circumstances are so different among the varying cases. For example, as I mentioned, my cases, my clients were arrested not on a battlefield but in a friendly country, Bosnia, where they were working, uh, living with their families, uh, and uh, not uh, with uh, any criminal record or any indication that they would be terrorists. Other, other people were arrested in Africa, other places in the world far from Afghanistan or Iraq. <coughs> Moreover, the enactment of both the DTA and the MCA with respect to habeas has caused extensive delays already in resolving these cases as the Court of Appeals here in Washington sought additional briefing and argument each time on the significance of these acts to the pending appeals. Therefore, the appeals took from 
early 2005 until uh, the middle of 2007 to resolve at the Court of Appeals level and obviously until June of 2008 to resolve at the Supreme Court level. Given the recognition of Secretary Rice, Secretary Gates, many others in the Congress and the government of the great damage done to U.S. prestige and reputation by our perceived failure to give the 275 men in Guantanamo any fair hearing despite the passage of six and a half years, it would be my suggestion that Congress stay at this, stay its hand at this time with regard to any further actions uh, concerning habeas and let the experienced federal trial judges down the street at the Prettyman Courthouse do their job, which is at long last to review the specific individual facts concerning these six, these remaining 275 men to determine which should be held and which should be ordered conditionally released. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Um, now, you all correct me if I mispronounce your name. Cat, you Perfect. I got it? That's okay. Perfect. Please. Th thank you, Chairman Skelton, Representative Hunter, uh, and members of the committee. The last time I was before your committee was in March of last year, and as I was preparing for today, I was reminded of your opening words, Chairman Skelton, at that hearing. You said, quote, Last year, when Congress passed the MCA, I argued that the most important task was to design a system that could withstand legal scrutiny. There are at least seven potential constitutional defects. First, it seems clear to me and many others that the act may be unconstitutionally stripping the federal courts of jurisdiction over habeas cases, end quote. Your opening statement, like the one you made today, went on to list a number of infirmities, including violations of the Geneva Conventions and equal protection as ex post facto, confrontation and exceptions clause problems under our Constitution. And you concluded, quote, providing for ex expedited review by the Supreme Court of these seven issues continues to be important. If the justices find the Military Commission Act includes constitutional infirmities, it is likely that known terrorists could receive a get out of jail free card or have their death sentences reversed. Chairman Skelton, what you said back in 2007 looks prophetic now in 2008. We stand now with that very act invalidated on the very ground you mentioned, stripping habeas corpus, a part of Anglo-American jurisprudence since the Magna Carta of 1215. Even before 2007, during those hasty Military Commission Act debates of 2006, the, many warned the administration that if they rushed to implement their proposed legislation, they would accomplish very little because that legislation had constitutional infirmities and courts would strike it down. But the administration's defenders reassured Congress that the Constitution did not apply to Guantanamo and not to worry. That legal advice was always dubious and the Supreme Court put an end to it. In the Boumediene decision last month, the court stated the political branches cannot switch the Constitution on and off as they please. Our basic charter cannot be contracted away like this, they said. And so here we are again, nearly seven years after the horrible 9-11 attacks, with only half of a single trial completed at Guantanamo and the Military Commission Act already struck down in part by our highest court. Now, some are proposing yet again another rush proposal to respond to the new court decision. The proposals are legion. Some would create a national security court. Others would centralize litigation and a few judges. And still others would try to overhaul the military commission process. I support many of these proposals. I think the military commissions created in 2006 are deficient and unlikely to survive judicial scrutiny. The act's foundational presumption in 2006 was that the Constitution did not apply to Guantanamo, and so the trials need not have even basic rights guaranteed by the Constitution, such as the right of a defendant not to have coerced testimony used against him. This system is going down, and it is right and proper for this body to put commissions on hold as soon as possible to develop appropriate, constitutionally balanced legislation. I am also a believer, to the chagrin of some, in a national security court to authorize a very limited preventative detention system for individuals who truly are unable to be tried in military or civilian court. I've been studying such a court for well over a year now, and the one thing I can say with certainty is that it is a very difficult undertaking. Who will the judges be? Who will the defense lawyers be, if any? How long will the detention periods last? Will there be periodic review? What evidence is going to come in? Who will be subject to the court's jurisdiction? Will there be appeals? There are hundreds of different models from which to choose. 
and yet each of them will differ from our traditional system of justice. Americans take pride in our criminal justice system, and our system works best when we convict terrorists in it. We showcase the rule of law and contrast it with the despicable world of the enemy who lacks respect for our way of life and our values. If we are to modify the system, we should do so cautiously with appreciation for the risks involved. That is why moving forward, the most important line in Boumediene belong not to the majority, but to the, chief, but to the dissent by Chief Justice John Roberts. He said, after the court in 2004 gave Guantanamo detainees habeas corpus rights, Congress responded 18 months later and cannot be faulted for taking that time to consider how best to accommodate both the detainees' interests and the need to keep the American people safe. Cannot be faulted for taking that time. The very worst time, it occurs to me, to contemplate such changes is a few months before an election, particularly when both presidential candidates have announced that they will close Guantanamo. A rush to judgment runs the risk of creating slogans, not sustainability. That is exactly what happened in 2006 with the military commissioning. We need a better plan than simply looking tough if we want to demonstrate to our courts and to the world that we are serious about terrorism. This country desperately needs and deserves a serious inquiry, perhaps catalyzed by a bipartisan national commission to examine whether a national security court is necessary and, if so, what it should look like. We have spent far too many years with intemperate solutions that have gotten us nowhere. Many warned the administration that they needed a plan for the day after the Supreme Court's highly predictable decision to restore basic habeas corpus rights to detainees, but the administration stubbornly clung to notions of executive power that the Supreme Court in Boumediene eviscerated. If we rush into legislation today, we will need yet another plan for the next predictable day after. Thank you. Well, thank the gentleman. I think I can pronounce this next one. Mr. Klingler, did I get it? Okay. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Hunter, members of the committee, I appreciate Be, be sure and um, you, you have to get real close to the microphone. So Sorry about that. Here. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to address you today in my personal capacity regarding the important issues raised by the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Boumediene versus Bush. I would like to emphasize a few points canvassed at greater length in my written testimony. Boumediene pre presents very significant issues that only legislation uh, can address uh, effectively. A little closer, please. Just speak right into it. Try better? Yeah, stay close to it. Yeah. I'll try to. Thank you. Federal courts have traditionally deferred very considerably to the executive branch and to Congress on military matters. Detaining persons the military has found to be enemy combatants is a central and legitimate component of the war on terrorists. As a unanimous Supreme Court indicated in a separate case just last month, the Constitution requires that the judiciary be as scrupulous not to interfere with legitimate army matters as the army must be scrupulous not to intervene in judicial matters. Boumediene abandoned that tradition of deference. It opens the door to an unprecedented era of judicial policymaking in military matters. At the same time, the decision provided almost no guidance to lower courts regarding the processes to be used in the newly required proceedings, the detainee's substantive rights, or the protections that must be afforded to military and security interests. The resulting problem is straightforward. In their new, undefined role overseeing military functions, civilian judges are likely to draw too directly on processes designed to protect U.S. citizens in traditional criminal proceedings. They're unlikely to appreciate how their decisions affect national security policy or the conduct of military operations. The principal problem created by the decision is not, I believe, with the military commission trials. Assertions of equal protection in international law difficulties are considerably overstated on the merits and have already been presented to federal courts and will be presented to them again upon review of any convictions. Some portray the issue as simply ensuring that the military holds people at Guantanamo who actually threaten Americans. The actual issue is far broader and more complex. The Boumediene decision is not limited by its terms to Guantanamo and has implications far beyond, including for Iraq and Afghanistan. The resulting judicial proceedings will allow judges to review the military's evidence supporting detention, but also to decide when and how the military is empowered to detain enemy combatants as judges find and define them. They create open-ended litigation regarding counterterrorist capabilities. 
Particular issues extend to how to resolve overlapping judicial processes, how to protect sensitive information, and how to ensure that military resources aren't diverted from their core tasks. And in the end, judges may make decisions for reasons having nothing to do with the evidence of threat or may make mistakes, leading to the release of persons who do, in fact, seek to kill American soldiers, civilians, and their allies. In these circumstances, Congress should fulfill the political branch's constitutional role. Legislation would create legal certainty and operational flexibility. The executive branch, through the Attorney General, has requested legislation to protect military and security interests. And the judiciary, through the Chief Judge of the District Co Court, most burdened by the uncertainties of litigation surrounding habeas petitions, has very unusually welcomed guidance from Congress and indicated that, quote, such guidance sooner rather than later would certainly be most helpful. More broadly, Congress has the opportunity to reaffirm the principles underlying the military's actions against terrorists. The nub of many of the judicial disputes is simply that some members of the judiciary and the bar do not believe that we are truly or appropriately at war against those who would use terror against our soldiers in this nation, or they believe that time is degraded to the threats we face to those we can manage through criminal-like processes. Assuming the Congress continues to support the military's counterterrorism efforts, reaffirming and clarifying the bounds of the AUMF would update that authorization in light of our increased knowledge of the foes we face. It would remind the courts of the commitment of two coordinate branches to using all appropriate means to confront pressing threats to our national security. Doing so may even return the courts to a centuries-old tradition of deferring to the political branches in matters of military and foreign affairs. Thank you. Colonel Davis. Thank you. Chairman Skelton, Mr. Hunter, members of the committee, uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in the hearing today. Much of what I have to say this morning is based upon my two plus years of experience as the chief prosecutor at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. However, I'm here speaking in my personal capacity, not on behalf of the Department of Defense or the Department of the Air Force. And I think you would have figured that out in any event, but I wanted to make that clear. You're going to have to get closer to just like everyone. Yeah. Yes, sir. For more than two years, I spent time inside the camp. I've sat down with some of the detainees. I've reviewed the evidence, both classified and unclassified. Uh, I led the prosecution for more than two years. In fact, the cases that are uh, being tried today, the Hamden case, I personally authorized and approved those charges. So I hope my experience and my observations will contribute to, uh, to a finding a credible way forward on how we deal with this important issue that in many ways defines who we are. I was privileged to serve for a quarter century as an Air Force Judge Advocate and to participate in the military justice system at almost every level and in a variety of different capacities. For most of my career, the military justice system operated in relative obscurity with little, little attention from the media, the public, or even Congress. Those of us who worked inside the military justice system always knew what a good system it was, but until the post 9-11 era, when the military justice system gained some notoriety as a uh, basis of comparison for the processes we would use to prosecute detainees, it was largely unknown and underappreciated. I was pleased that during the uh, debate over the Military Commission Act, people from across the political and ideological spectrum referred to military justice as the gold standard of justice. Some of us knew that all along, but it was nice to see it recognized on a broad scale. The process is currently in place to deal with detainees, particularly those at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, are being sold to the public as part of the ongoing war on terrorism. They're included in Title 10 of the United States Code, the section on armed forces, not Title 18. And they're supposedly wrapped under the military justice banner. In my view, what we're doing at Guantanamo Bay is neither military nor justice. And it ref if this reflects what passes for military justice in 2008, I'm glad my uniform is hanging in a closet. This isn't the military justice system I respected and admired for nearly 25 years. Over the past several months, I've written a number of articles and given talks and done interviews and shared my observations with special interest groups, non-governmental organization, think tanks, and some members of this body. 
the question of how we move forward to ensure the treat treatment of detainees and to begin to restore our reputation in the eyes of the world is an important issue but with soaring gas prices plunging home values rising foreclosures a looming record deficit in wars in iraq and afghanistan and all of that taking place within a hundred days of an election this probably isn't the number one issue on a lot of people's lists i understand that as someone about to be unemployed and with a uh, interest only adjustable rate mortgage is probably not number one on my list either but it should be on everybody's top ten list it's an issue that warrants thoughtful consideration now and we shouldn't wait until after November 4th or January 20th to begin having this discussion now I think the most benef beneficial use of our time today will be in answering your question so I'm going to keep my comments relatively brief However, there are a few points to keep in mind in discussing uh, detainees at Guantanamo Bay. One thing I found in talking to different groups is apparently I'm in the middle of the road. I tend to get hit by folks on uh, either side. I tend to aggravate everybody because I think my views uh, are neither left nor right. I think first it's important uh, that to recognize that there's an inter internationally recognized right during a period of armed conflict to indefinitely detain the enemy to keep him from in inflicting harm on us and on others. To the best of my knowledge, there's never been and there never will be a date certain that we know when an armed conflict is going to end. Now that's not to discount in any way the $64,000 question of how we assess who is or is not the enemy, but some seem to argue and believe that unless we bring criminal charges or release a detainee with some within some prescribed period of time that we've committed a foul and that's just not the case. Second, the intelligence community wants to know what's going to happen in the future in order to prevent the next 9-11. The law enforcement community wants to know what happened in the past to punish those responsible for the last 9-11. As you can see, the perspectives are in opposite directions, one being prospective and one being retrospective. Add to that that one agency operates in a very rigid and very visible environment where the rules are well known, things like Miranda rights, speedy trial, chain of custody, search warrants, and such. The other operates in a very fluid and invisible environment where the rules are generally secret. When you try to overlay the two communities, you get a lot of square peg and round hole problems. And in a nutshell, that's Guantanamo Bay, which began as an intelligence operation and largely is still to this day an intelligence operation with any thought of some law enforcement or criminal prosecution process taking a back seat at best. Now it's wonderful when those two conflicting communities overlap and dovetail, but that's seldom the case. And that's the real conundrum with Guantanamo Bay. Lloyd Cutler was a giant in the legal community, having served as White House counsel twice and as co-founder of one of the most prestigious law firms in the world. In 1942, when he was just beginning his career, he served as a prosecutor in the uh, trial of the eight Nazi saboteurs, which took place not too far from where we are today, and which led to the Supreme Court decision in Ex parte Kieran. In December 2001, Mr. Cutler wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal drawing on his experience from more than 60 years earlier. He said, how we prosecute the members of Al-Qaeda and their supporters will say as much about the American legal system as it does about Al-Qaeda. Now, Mr. Cutler passed away in 2005, and I doubt if he was here today, he'd be pleased with what the past 80 months have said about the American legal system. We're better than this. Military commissions apply only to, to only some of the detainees, certainly not the entirety, and my experience is pretty much limited to the military commission cases. Judge James Robertson, in his decision on July 18th, denying Salim Hamdan's request for an injunction in the military commission, said, quote, the eyes of the world are on Guantanamo Bay. Justice must be done there, and it must be seen to be done there fairly and impartially, end quote. And I believe the current system may do justice in some cases, perhaps in many cases, but we need a system that's capable of doing justice in all cases. There are, in my view, four main problems with the current military justice process, and I'd stop to say that uh, I believe that the Military Commissions Act was a commendable piece of legislation, and I still believe that. It was the implementation by political appointees after it had been uh, passed by Congress 
signed by the president where it was hijacked along the way the four areas are one if the military commission is really a military commission it should be under military control and free of political interference now proponents argue that a commission is really for all practical purposes just like a court martial well for a variety of reasons the analogy to the court martial system does not fit and i'll give you one example since 9-11, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps has conducted in excess of 50,000 court-martials. To the best of my knowledge, each of those 50,000 court-martials was convened by a military officer, not by a political appointee. So if the military commissions are just like a court-martial, why are these the only Title X criminal proceedings convened by a political appointee who has never worn a military uniform a day in her life? Second, in the court martial system, the convening authority and his or her senior attorney, what we refer to as a staff judge advocate, has some oversight authority over the prosecutors. And it's that level of command involvement in the military justice system that's often cited as the greatest weakness in the court martial process. All of the, all the comparable international tribunals that are sanctioned by the UN guarantee the independence of the prosecutors. Trying to explain what a convening authority is is a difficult proposition, particularly to an international audience who's accustomed to that international model where prosecutors are independent. Now, I thought language that Senator Lindsey Graham added to the Military Commissions Act at my request ensured that no one could try to influence the exercise of professional judgment by me or the prosecutors. And it aligned us more closely with the international model that would be more understandable to the international community. But it hadn't stopped some from continuing to try to influence the process. The military judge in the Hamden case is Navy Captain Keith Allred. And he ruled that the legal advisor to the convening authority, Brigadier General Tom Hartman, broke the law by engaging in unlawful influence over me and the prosecution in the Hamden case. And he disqualified General Hartman from any further involvement in the Hamden case. Unlawful influence has been called the mortal enemy of military justice. So many waited to see how the Department of Defense would respond to a finding that the legal advisor broke the law. Well, what's happened since that finding that he broke the law has been nine more detainees have been charged, the 9-11 cases have been referred to trial, and General Hartman is still in place and pressing ahead at full speed. Third, we have to make a commitment to open and transparent trials. Some closed sessions are inevitable, but that should be the exception and not the rule. I can tell you from firsthand experience that the evidence declassification process is time consuming and is frustrating, but it's necessary if we're gonna have open trials. You can have speed, but if you have speed, it comes at the expense of transparency. And as tainted as the process has become in the eyes of the world, I believe it's imperative that we take the time and the effort to make these trials as open and transparent as possible. In fact, I'd often joked in the past that we should have these proceedings on court TV, and I still think that might be a good idea. Finally, we must reject the use of evidence obtained by unduly coercive techniques such as waterboarding. Those techniques may produce useful intelligence but they do not produce reliable evidence suitable for use in an American court of justice. If we condone it now, we forfeit the right to condemn it later when the shoe is on the other foot. Information obtained by convincing a man to say what the interrogator wants to hear or possibly die, which is really what waterboarding is, or the same as putting a gun to someone's head and saying, I'm going to count to 10 and pull the trigger if you don't talk. It's what the person on the other end believes. It doesn't matter if the gun's empty and there's no possibility of death or if the water border's not going to drown the individual. The person on the other end doesn't know that, and he believes his choices are talk or possibly die. That practice has no place in an American court of justice, and it should be banned. In a speech delivered in April at West Point, Secretary Gates said, quote, listen to me very carefully. If as an officer you don't tell blunt truths, then you've done yourself and the institution a disservice, close quote. Later in June at a speech he gave at Langley Air Force Base, he said, quote, none of the services easily accept honest criticism or scrutiny that expose institutional shortcomings. This is something I believe must change across the military. 
Secretary Gates went on to say, quote, when you see failures or problems, throw a flag. Bring them to the attention of people who can do something about it, end quote. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I've thrown the flag and I've told blunt truth. As a result, my service has been characterized as dishonorable. I was denied a medal for my service as chief prosecutor. And I find that uh, the truth not only sets you free, it also makes you largely unemployable. And that's fine. To me, it would be a disservice if I'd put my head down, uh, pressed ahead, and pretended everything was fine when it was not. And I have no regrets about doing what I did. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Well, thank you for uh, <coughs> your testimony and for each of you and your excellent words of, of uh, wisdom and advice for us. Uh, Colonel Davis, it's interesting to note your reference to the 1942 uh, case. Uh, of, of personal interest, there was a uh, World War I soldier stayed in the Army Reserve as a JAG officer by the name of Colonel Carl Ristein uh, from my hometown of Lexington, Missouri, and was uh, quite a well-known lawyer in western Missouri. When the Second World War came along, he uh, returned to active duty and was the lawyer for one of the two, I think his name was Dash, um, <clears throat> who was not given the death penalty from the 1942 uh, commission. My recollection is that six of the eight German saboteurs to be were given the death penalty and that was carried out immediately. Two were not, is my recollection. And Colonel Carl Ristein represented the uh, the one and, and uh, the footnote uh, he was uh, he was my father's mentor when my father graduated from law school <laughs> so it's rather interesting that it today in your testimony you mentioned it let me ask one question um, before I ask Mr. Hunter Mr. Oleski um, could could you address the suggested points that the Attorney General made uh, for, or recommended for congressional action in response to the Bomadine case, um, w w would, would you respond as to how, I don't know if you have the list of them there in front of you, would you respond as to your thoughts on each of them, I think there's six of them please. I don't have a list in front of me, Mr. Chairman, but I'm generally familiar with the Attorney General's suggestions. Why, why don't you go ahead and tell us your thoughts? Uh, absolutely. Uh, essentially, uh, what he's suggested is that Congress step in and tell the federal courts how to conduct the habeas proceedings to decide uh, what the burden of proof should be, to decide how to deal with classified evidence, and a, and a lot of other things, a lot of other issues that trial judges who hear habeas cases every day coming out of the federal and state courts normally do in, dis in reviewing and deciding habeas cases. As I uh, stated in my remarks, the problem with that one-size-fits-all approach is that no one sitting in Congress or in any uh, advisory capacity over a habeas case is ever going to know enough about the facts that are at issue in a particular case because they're so varying and different and raise so many issues to be able to devise a protocol that will work. So my view is that the federal courts have extensive experience dealing with these issues that are now presented by this ruling. It's only the ruling that's unusual, not the issues that have to be explored, which is what's the basis to hold somebody indefinitely what are their defenses, what are the facts that bear on that decision to hold, and what are the facts that bear on whether the person should be released. These are, if not garden variety issues, very common issues that federal habeas courts in every jurisdiction represented by every one of you in the country 
deal with, uh, if not every day, then every week. So what happened with the MCA and the DTA, as we've all been saying in our various ways, were that some clarity was brought to some aspects of these military commission and habeas proceedings, but fundamentally we ended up with years of appeals that were foretold by many uh, of us and many of you, resulting in delays from 2002, really, when the first case was brought until 2008, so six and a half years of appeals just to get to the fundamental issue in each individual case of whether someone should be held further or should be released. Legislation, in my view, uh, well-intentioned as it may be, is not going to clarify those circumstances. It's going to complexify and complicate those circumstances, delay the cases, lead to general appeals that, will, that are likely, again, to hold up all the cases. And in contrast, uh, Judge Leon and Judge Hogan are now moving these cases forward rapidly on schedules which they're very uh, easily able to handle and establish. And, th and the cases are going to be tried, it appears, in the relatively near future. Certainly my case is in front of Judge Leon. So I understand why the Attorney General the Administration say that, Mr. Chairman, but I don't think that the result will be anything that any of us will be proud of, as Mr. Davis and Mr. Tatchell were saying about what's happening in the military commission area. Thank you. I, 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 was, uh, I should have uh, read the Attorney General's uh, quick summary before <laughs> asking you that question, Ms. Wileski, but let me do that very quickly, and then I'll ask uh, for brief comments from each of the other three panel members. One, prohibit the federal court from ordering the government to bring enemy combatants into the United States. Two, adopt procedural safeguards to protect the sources and methods of intelligence gathering. Three, to ensure that habeas proceedings do not delay military commission trials of detainees charged with war crimes. Four, acknowledge explicitly that this nation remains engaged in armed conflict with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and associated organization and reaffirm that for the duration of the conflict against these groups, we may main, the United States may detain enemy combatants. Uh, fifth and last, establish the sensible procedures for habeas challenges uh, going forward to, by ensuring that the one district court has exclusive jurisdiction over the proceeding. And, and excuse me, there's a sixth one, limit the ability of detainees to pursue other forms of litigation. Yes, so uh, that, that's, uh, the, the, those are the six recommendations made by the Attorney General. Let me ask if you have comments or thoughts on them. We'll go right down the line. Uh, let, me, let me just Maybe. comment specifically, uh, Mr. Chairman, on yes. those six points then. Yes. Uh, release into the United States. Uh, the Supreme Court was very clear. The law is clear that a habeas judge can't release anywhere. He can order a conditional release in this case. So, or, or she can order a, a, a conditional release subject to the decision by the executive branch about uh, how to return and where to return the particular prisoner. So I think that's not a real issue as I see it. In terms of classified evidence, uh, Colonel Davis has referred to how the military commissions handle that. There's a federal statute that the Congress enacted, the CIPA, CIPA statute, that provides procedures for that. That's been done in every uh, terrorist criminal trial that I can think of. I don't think more legislation is needed on that. Uh, Chim, uh, the uh, ranking member commented on delaying the military commissions as not being in anybody's interest. I think we all agree that. I can't see how further legislation at this time with cases going forward would not delay those cases and resulting appeals. Others may differ. The president right, president's right to detain enemy combatants is something spelled out in the authorization for, for use of military force resolution of the Congress of September 18, 2001. That's in the process of being worked out as to what it means as to each detainee on a case-by-case -case basis. That's what has to happen. I, uh, each detainee has a different story, a different set of facts, and the government's right to detain them further will turn on where they fit in the scheme that you all outlined in general in that resolution. I don't believe that that needs further clarification at this time. Consolidation of cases, the Supreme Court said they should all be heard essentially in one court. They're all being heard in the district court right down the street, as I said. 
and they're all being consolidated for preliminary purposes before two judges who are ruling on all the general and common issues that are likely to arise. And then as to multiple avenues for litigation, you all decided in 2005 and 6 to allow a process for review of the combat status review tribunals. Most of us went forward and filed both habeas actions, which were uh, doubtful until the Supreme Court ruled in June, and DTA cases. Most of us will probably pursue habeas cases for the reasons I stated in my opening remarks. There's no showing that anyone has abused the second avenue, the DTA avenue. There are lots of statutes that allow more than one claim and sometimes in more than one court. This is more a theoretical concern right now than a real concern as I see it. Thank you, Mr. Cattell. Uh, Your comments. I, I support the idea of legislation in general. Our founders in Article I, Section 8, gave this body, the Congress, the prerogative over legislation in this area. And I do think legislation is inevitable uh, at some point uh, for reasons that I think Representative Hunter illustrated and also uh, things that Justice Jackson said earlier in, Youngstown, in his uh, famous Youngstown opinion that legislation will put uh, the program on more stable footing and produce a, s a program that's more sustainable in courts and in the world's community. However, having said that, this does not seem right now to be the appropriate time for legislation for a couple of reasons. One is we don't have any experience yet with how the federal courts are going to handle this. I think we should let the system play out a little bit, as Mr. Oleski said, see how the federal courts are dealing with this. There's a system in place uh, by very experienced judges. Uh, there isn't some overwhelming need right now to act. Uh, and then this body can be informed by that legislative experience, by that uh, judicial experience. Uh, in addition, uh, I'm very worried about a rush to judgment in this area. We did that in 2006. Some people warned Congress that if you do so, it, the program's not going to be sustainable. It's going to be struck down. That's exactly what happened. And so I think before acting again, we need to do this in very carefully with all the relevant information. Let me speak to one aspect of uh, Attorney General Mukasey's uh, uh, comments, his third one, about clarifying that uh, the writ of habeas corpus should not delay military commission trials. I think that's a very dangerous idea. These military commissions are unprecedented. We've never had trials like this before in America. And I think uh, anyone who listened to Colonel Davis's remarks a moment ago will understand just how different these trials are. The worst time to review the legality of these trials is after they've taken place. There are a lot of constitutional problems with, this li with, with the military commissions going on. And if, as I suspect, courts will invalidate that system down the road, you do run the prospect of, as, re as, re as Chairman Skelton said last year, terrorists going free or possibly having to be retried. That's a terrible way of meeting out justice. Instead, we should do what Representative Skelton proposed before, which is expedite review over the military commission process. Let's make sure that system is legal, if, as its defenders say, it is. If it's legal, let's have the trials, let's have them go forward. If it's not, then let's have a new system uh, come in and take place. I I'm very sympathetic to what Ranking Member Hunter said a moment ago, that the victims of 9-11 should not have to wait any longer for trials. Let's have real trials, let's make sure they're on a stable footing, and then uh, and, and then have them have them instead of having them be invalidated years after the fact. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Klinger is next on the list, and, and then Colonel. Go ahead, Mr. Klinger. Thank you. Uh, if I could just address your question by picking up some of the comments that have been made. The notion that there are only garden variety issues before the habeas courts, I think, is just a fantasy. The notion that there won't be years of appeals, I think, has no basis at all. The chief judge of the district has welcomed quick congressional guidance. Judge Hogan isn't processing cases. What Judge Hogan has done is request briefing, very extensive briefing, from the government and from detainees' lawyers on a whole range of open issues. What types of discovery must there be? How much classified and intelligence information does the government have to offer up? What standard? Is it clear and convincing? Is it some traditional standard regarding the government's showing that's required? What type of presumption, if any, does the government get? What kind of hearsay 
can be offered? What kind of witnesses can be pulled forth? Do they get to be called from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan? Can the detainees personally participate? Are they going to be able to call other detainees as witnesses? All these are open common issues that are being briefed right now. It's not as though the cases are being presented in the initial form. Uh, as to uh, some of the particular issues, I mean, I've covered those in some of the written testimony. I just address two briefly. Uh, the release in the United States point, I was initially somewhat um, less sympathetic to that point than to the others of the Attorney Generals, and then I found out that, in fact, some of the detain one of the detainees' lawyers has, in fact, requested release in the United States, and uh, in the case of Parhat, is my understanding. As to the timing of the military commission trials versus habeas proceedings, I think the notion of final resolution, either through legislation or through court processes, of the lawfulness of the military commission process before we've even seen how they perform, before we've seen how the judges and how the appeal process works, that is going to be a tremendous range of delay. Legislation would take time uh, to finally resolve any differences, and certainly the course that uh, Professor Katchel would have of going into federal court in habeas proceedings to disrupt and delay the military commission trials is one that would just uh, initiate a long-standing judicial process. And I think the judge who heard those arguments already that uh, the professor has put forth uh, didn't reject them on their merits, but appropriately abstained pending the operation of the military trial process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colonel. I, I guess two points. One is uh, my personal opinion is I think the Boumidian decision was wrongly decided. Of course, and it's the court's opinion that counts and not my own. My personal opinion is a uh, foreign terrorist whose only connection to the Constitution is destroying it have no constitutional right. Uh, the court disagreed, and it's their opinion that counts. So I disagree with the rationale, but if the result is that it gets folks to pay attention to the issue, then I can live with the rationale if it gets a good result. My read of the Boumidian decision is what the court was, I think the court was very deferential to the executive branch. If you recall initially when Boumidian was filed, the court refused to hear it. Then uh, uh, Colonel Steve uh, Abraham came forward, who'd sat on some of the CSERC proceedings and identified uh, some defects, where in some cases the evidence was flimsy and others, if the result wasn't what the leadership wanted, they just redid it until they got the right result. And then, amazingly, the, you know, the only time in my lifetime the court reconsidered and agreed to hear the Boumidian case, which to me, and then the decision itself, is an expression of a lack of confidence in the executive branch to do it right that folks have a right to some meaningful review before they're locked up for in excess of 80 months. And the you know, th I think that the Attorney General's comments were somewhat disingenuous to kind of throw down the gauntlet and say Congress has got to fix this in the next couple of months when the administration's had 80 months since the President signed the order in November of 2001 to get this right, and they haven't gotten it right. It was frustrating over a year ago when the court granted review in Boumidi, and about that same time we had two cases down at Gitmo, Cotter and Hamden, where the judge, judges in those cases dismissed charges for lack of jurisdiction because there was a disconnect in the wording. The jurisdictional language of the Military Commissions Act said we have jurisdiction over unlawful enemy combatants. The regulation for the CSERT process requires that tribunal to make a finding the individual is an a, uh, enemy combatant but not an unlawful enemy combatant. So we had a disconnect in the language. There were a number of us that proposed, since we had two problems then, you had Boumidian was being heard by the Supreme Court, we had us thrown out of court out of the military commissions because of these defects in the jurisdictional language, why not fix the C-certs and do them right? Which hopefully would uh, allay the concerns of the Supreme Court and also fix the jurisdictional problem. But it is tended to be the case quite often, there were a few people that, uh, what I've described many times, I think it was a combination of arrogance and ignorance that they knew the right way to do it and they didn't need any assistance with doing it right. So rather than fix the C-certs, uh, here we are more than a year later you know, with this mess and the Attorney General suggesting that you've got to fix it the next couple of months and I think that's wrong. Colonel, thank you. Mr. Hunter. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And again, and gentlemen, thank you for your uh, testimony. Um, you know, again, I'm looking at this at this bundle of rights that uh, that we went over, Senate and the House, when we put together the Detainee uh, uh, Treatment Act and the Military Commission Act. Uh, right to counsel, presumption of innocence, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, opportunity to obtain witnesses and other evidence, uh, right to discovery, exculpatory evidence provided uh, to defense counsel, statements obtained through torture are excluded. The classified evidence, I remember the, the, the uh, exercise we went through, the difficulty of making sure that you maintain the secrecy of evidence, which nonetheless the, uh, uh, the uh, accused has a right to confront. And we finally went through this exercise of redaction uh, that would be utilized to try to make sure that they were given the fairest shot possible at being able to confront the evidence that was used against them. Uh, that went through a lot of iterations and a lot of analysis by counsel in the House and the Senate as we put this thing together. Uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the uh, statements obtained through coercion or only admissible if the military judge rules that the statement is reliable and probative. Uh, because most of these people come, while some of, not all of them come from the battlefield situation, most of them do, the situation in which many of these statements are made is inherently coercive. Uh, and we had a, uh, we obviously had to work our way through that. Uh, certified impartial judge. Uh, we went to the, uh, the question we were concerned about as to whether a, if you had military officers on this, uh, uh, on the tribunal, whether you would have a vote for guilty by a junior officer on the basis that his uh, superiors were watching him and were on the, on the body with him. So we provided for the secret ballot. Uh, we did things that went far beyond what I saw as a standard of Nuremberg, Rwanda, and other, other councils. So my first question would be is, have you looked at this bundle of rights uh, that we gave to the accused in the, in the uh, MCA? And, and uh, which, uh, what uh, additional rights would you give to them? Thank oh, you sir. very much, uh, Ranking Member Hunter. Um, I have looked at them, and uh, they are the same rights, largely, as what the administration said the last military commission system had in 2006. When, when I argued the Hamdan case uh, before the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General's brief listed the very rights you said, the right to counsel, presumption of innocence, opportunity to get evidence, right to discovery, the use of torture being excluded, uh, the impartial judge, and so on, uh, the provision of a defense counsel, and so on. That was all at page two of their brief, uh, and what the Solicitor General opened his argument to the Supreme Court with. It wasn't enough, and it wasn't enough for one simple reason. Uh, it's not about the rights on paper. It's about, rather, what the system is ultimate backdrop is. In both 2006 and now, there's been an assumption that the Constitution does not protect the detainees at Guantanamo Bay. And because of that, these rights, while they're on paper, wind up not being very much in practice. And that's what I think Colonel Davis was getting at when he said that the military justice system that, we, that he knows is the gold standard of justice and what's happening at Guantanamo Bay is neither military nor justice. I mean, this is a remarkable thing. We've been adversaries for two years on the very same case, the chief prosecutor and one of the defense attorneys, and yet I think you're hearing some agreement from the people who have experience in the system in telling you that the rights on paper aren't the rights that translate uh, in practice. And what yes, needs but, but counsel, what we have the power to do here is to, is to write the law mm -hmm. uh, with the expectation it's going to be followed. Now, obviously, if, if those rights are not allowed, uh, then that's reversible error and, uh, and, uh, and is something that, ca that can be corrected. But the point is, uh, my question to you is, when we put this thing together, we looked at, at terrorist tribunals, and we looked at Nuremberg, we looked at Rwanda, we looked at these other tribunals, and we gave a larger package of rights, it appears to me. Uh, for example, in, uh, in uh, Nuremberg, I believe you only had one layer of appeal. Here you've got uh, three layers of appeal. Uh, we gave a larger package of rights than, than these previous terrorist councils. So my, my question to you is, in, in what we have laid out in the law, 
because that's what we're dealing with. You've got a you've got a trial going forward right now, and you've got 20, as I understand, some 20 commissions gearing up to go. They're going to go with what I just uh, laid out and what you just acknowledged are, in fact, this uh, this bundle of rights. So my question to you is: Do you think that additional rights? Do you think we've uh, that these are inadequate, and there are additional rights that should be in the commission's law? So we could have a debate about Nuremberg or Rwanda or the other tribunals. I, I certainly think that, for example, none of the other tribunals have such broad substantive offenses such as conspiracy. That's something that Nuremberg rejected, yet it's being used in most of those 20 cases today. But my fundamental point, um, uh, uh, Ranking Member Hunter, is that we don't live in Rwanda and we don't live in Nuremberg. We live in the United States of America, and in the United States of America we're governed by the United States Constitution. And the United States Constitution sets out some, uh, it sets out a backdrop. A and, I've, and I've, and I've, and, and conceding that we don't live there, that's why my question to you was, are there additional rights uh, beyond this package of rights that we put in legislation that you think should be in the MCA? Very so basic. So what, what, what additional do you think we should give the, to the accused? The rights guaranteed by the Constitution writ large. That is, it's not, it's not the micro rights that you're pointing to. It's the bigger right that says that all of these, uh, you know, that these problems are constitutionally based. They're not just statutorily based. Without that fundamental backdrop of understanding that the Constitution constrains what's going on at Guantanamo, the rights can be chipped away w at on either side. And that's what I think the well, Supreme Court was getting at in 2006, that okay. it's not the rights on paper. Okay, let, but well, but, but when we write a law, the law is always on paper, and we, we, uh, we presume that the law will be followed. And if the law is not followed, uh, that's reversible error. So my next group, so let me ask the other gentleman, do you see, are there other substantive rights? Uh, and incidentally, I wouldn't refer to the right, of, right to counsel uh, and the presumption of innocence as, uh, as trivial or, uh, or somehow uh, technical rights. Those are very fundamental rights. Uh, do the other uh, counsel have any, uh, have any additional rights that you would add to this package? Now let me go left, left to right here, sir. Uh, ranking member, I don't, I don't have any clients, fortunately, in front of military commissions. I haven't. I really am not here today to testify on that subject. I defer to. Okay. Colonel if you Gates. could look for the record, if you could look through the the MCA as we as we uh, put it together and see if there's additional rights that you would recommend, I'd like to see those for the record. If you could do. Uh, yes, sir, Colonel. No, I don't think so. As I, as I said, and I think you know we have a disagreement. I, you know, my personal opinion is they don't have constitutional rights. They have rights under Article Three of the Geneva Convention is expounded upon in, uh, I think it's Article 75 of the Additional Protocol, which to me lays out their fundamental rights, which are covered in the Military Commissions Act. Okay. Uh, Mr. Klingler, do you see any additional rights beyond this package of 15 rights that I've enumerated that you think the accused should have? Yeah. Well, Boumediene well, simply didn't hold that the Constitution extends all rights contained in the Constitution to Guantanamo detainees. I think that that's a mischaracterization of the decision, and I think they're a contrary court decision. I think the short answer to your question is that the only point that Boumediene called into question is potentially the exclusive direct review in the federal courts and the preclusion of habeas rights after there's any conviction that oh. takes place. Okay, L let, me, let, me, uh, uh, let me go to the habeas rights. Um, we had the case, it was after World War II, uh, um, in, which a, uh, in which an appeal was made to the Supreme Court or a request for habeas was made, uh, presumably by one of the criminal uh, uh, accused of, world, of uh, world War II. It was the, uh, uh, the Eisentrager case. And the Supreme Court, uh, this was, uh, uh, the Supreme Court was, uh, was uh, requested to give habeas uh, but they were imprisoned outside of the United States, and the, the decision by the court was they didn't have a right to ask for habeas. Now, uh, as I understand, both the Supreme Court ruled both in, in uh, Razul versus uh, Bush and on the instant case, uh, Bam Yudan, that, uh, uh, that the holding in Eisentrager didn't apply to Gitmo, to Guantanamo. So, so here's my question. Uh, you've, uh, you've all described to some degree, or at least uh, several of you de have described uh, 
uh, habeas as a um, as uh, uh, rising from from uh, uh, from basic American values, and I think the the chairman had laid that out in his opening statement. But the court in uh, in Eisentrager said, "Wait a minute! Uh, if you're uh, you're making this thing, you're a detainee, and uh, uh, presumably in Germany, you don't have the right." And the recent court said, "We still agree with that. If if you weren't in Gitmo, we wouldn't give you that right." So my question to you is, uh, do you think that the detainees in uh, in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan? Because when we, when we talked about Guantanamo, we talked about control. We said, wait a minute, maybe Guantanamo is not a state, but it's definitely under American control. It's an extension of American control. That same argument could be made with respect to people that are under the supervision of a Marine sergeant in Afghanistan or Iraq. So my question to all four of you is, do you think that, uh, that habeas should be applicable uh, to detainees that are held in other parts of the world, in, and specifically Iraq and Afghanistan. I'll just go from left to right. What do you think? I think the, the court was um, proceeding cautiously on that question as I read the decision. What they were saying was that what you have in Guantanamo is not only a place under total United States control and dominion, you also have people who've been held without any approximation of process for six and a half years, and it's that the latter point that seemed to be the, to me to be the driver for the court that we'd held people for so long in such a place, said we had a process, what we're referring to as the CSERT process, given limited review of that limited process, and that wasn't enough in those particular circumstances to hold people for that length but, of time. But don't so you think that same circumstance could take place in Iraq or Afghanistan, that people would be held for a long period of time? You could make that argument? I imagine that that could happen and that people will make that argument. So do you see court, And the courts will deal with it when it comes along. Okay, but in your, in your opinion, uh, should, uh, should habeas be afforded to detainees under American control uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan? If they meet those circumstances as found in Boumediene, that would be a fact-intensive question arising in those cases. How long has the person been held? Is he okay. a prisoner of war or an enemy combatant? Has he had a CSRT? How long before did the CSRT take place? As was just said in answer to other questions, has the CSRT process been revised to make it more fair and adversarial? Okay. Those are all be So in some questions. cases it might be yes, in other cases no. That would be my view. Okay. Sir? Uh, I would uh, agree uh, with the way you had characterized it and believe that the Supreme Court's decisions are clear that there is no habeas corpus rights in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, Guantanamo, the court has said, is different because uh, no other law applies. There isn't a law of Iraq or Afghanistan to protect the detainees. There is only United States law. We don't recognize Cuban laws having any force at Guantanamo. Okay, but you wouldn't, so you, you would not, uh, you do not believe that habeas attaches to detainees in Iraq or Afghanistan? I do not. We do not have total control okay. over those areas. Okay, Colonel? I don't think it applies at Guantanamo, so certainly not Iraq or Afghanistan. Okay, Mr. Klingler? I don't. I think that that would be a, just a gross distortion of the history of the writ and the purposes for which it's used if it were implemented in the battlefield areas particularly or okay. anywhere, frankly. But but if I could, just one. Uh, I think Boumediene, that's the best reading of Boumediene as well. However, it's clear that Boumediene's open-ended test created the uh, opportunity for counsel, and we heard it at the end of the table, to argue that, in fact, the writ does extend. And as you said, cases, a petition's been filed in relation to that. There's going to be litigation over this for, and uncertainty for some time. Okay. Uh, the Miranda rights, uh, the right to, because you've, you've talked, uh, uh, gentlemen, about the uh, need to not uh, undertake, uh, uh, to not accept uh, testimony has been coerced, and by its very nature, the battlefield is coercive. Uh, and and the, uh, the safeguard that was imposed uh, in our domestic system was to give Miranda rights so that people were told, uh, they were instructed that they didn't have to talk. So when they saw that police dog and they saw that snub-nosed uh, 38 or 45 that the officer had, that wouldn't coerce them into saying something that they wish they hadn't said later. Uh, so we had, we uh, inserted that, uh, that safeguard. Um, 
do you think that on the battlefield that uh, that enemy uh, combatants uh, should have the right to uh, be Mirandized, to be given the Miranda warning so that they don't are not later in a court in which they feel that they are being prosecuted with coerced statements uh, left or right? What do you think? I don't think the Supreme Court was saying that. I think the, the court. Well, no, no, I'm not asking what the Supreme Court said. I'm asking. I mean, they they made a statement on a limited area. I'm asking for your expert opinion or your feeling uh, as to whether that's that is a uh, uh, that is a a right that should be afforded to enemy combatants to ensure that they don't make coerced statements. Okay. That is to make sure that they are. They are advised on the battlefield upon being apprehended that they do not have to speak and that their what they say will be used against them. I, do you I, think I, they should have that right? I wouldn't advocate for that, uh, Representative Hunter. I think that's not practical on the battlefield. And I do have to make my touchstone. Well, with okay. Well, let, let me hold on for a second then. If that's so, or maybe I should ask the next gentleman because you said coerced statements should not be utilized. But he, he and I are talking about uh, the situations that we're all familiar with, where people are taken into imprisonment, sent to Guantanamo, or sent to some other place, and then tortured and mistreated. And that's been basic in our law for 75 years, that that kind of a statement, post-apprehension, after you've been detained and seized and held, doesn't produce reliable evidence, and so it shouldn't be admitted. Well, th that's that may be so, uh, counsel, but any good lawyer is, is, is not going to differentiate between the treatment on the battlefield where he may make his most damning statements uh, in which he's surrounded by people with weapons, which he will allege later were pointed right at him when they, uh, when they got the, uh, uh, took those statements, extracted those statements from him. That's why we have, that's why Miranda is always given early on. It's not given later on in the uh, in the uh, uh, when you're in the uh, incarceration when you're in jail or in prison. It's given right at the point when you are suspected of criminal activity, and that was done for a reason, and that's so that you wouldn't you would know that you didn't have to make the statement. So my question is because you, uh, our counsel advised us, or one of our witnesses advised us at one hearing that if you'd followed the UCMJ, which was advocated by some members of Congress a Miranda warning would be necessary on the battlefield. So my question is, to prevent coercive statements being taken, do you think that, that Miranda uh, uh, should be followed? Sir? sir uh, I'm not sure who that witness was you're referring to, and I obviously have respect for any witness. One of our JAG this, witnesses. Uh, but yeah. um, uh, my understanding is that there is no way that Miranda rights will apply to people on the battlefield, uh, captured on the battlefield, right at that battlefield situation. And the reason is, the, our nation's highest military court, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, in 1992 decided a case, I think it's called United States versus Lone Tree. And what Lone Tree says is that when someone is even being interrogated, and the interrogation is motivated by intelligence, then there is no need to read Miranda rights. So it's an even broader exception in our current military system than the one you're positing about Mir Miranda being read to people on the battlefield. So I think that would take care of your uh, worry, the existing military law. I, but I think you may be wrong, because Lone Tree, I believe, was, a, was a, an espionage case with respect to embassy activity, and I think that the clearly the, uh, the, the uh, presence on the battlefield, the in inherent coercive uh, uh, situation on a battlefield with lots of people with weapons, uh, at least I, w I would think most lawyers it's would use that as, as a proof of a coercive sir, environment sir, it's when statements are made. Uh, so uh, it's you, you might be right that Lone Tree will be brought up, but I think it might be difficult to make Lone the Tree. The battlefield is undoubtedly up. coercive, and that aspect was in addition Lone Tree, but Lone Tree says that's not what's relevant. It's the purpose underlying the interrogation, and the purpose, I think, would be the same. I, I don't see uh, any good defense lawyer winning this argument. Sorry. Okay, but in your estimation, uh, Miranda should not be a part, uh, should not be extended. That's correct. Okay, sir, uh, Colonel, what do you think? Well, first off, you know, the witness that, that was referred to that was asked the question, the, I think the person you described in your opening statement is a very experienced military prosecutor. That was me. I was sitting in the back row at the hearing that you were the chairman of, and the issue came up. That, that was you. That's that right. We said if you took the uh, if you took the uh, the guy shot at you with an AK-47 because we had a number of members saying why can't we use UCMJ, right. and I asked you the question, would you have to Mirandize him if you used the UCMJ? If you applied it and you said yes, you would. 
Right. Yeah, I believe it was right. uh, Professor Michael Sharp was the witness. He said well, he wasn't an expert on military law, but the guy. And in I the referred back row to you as some was, jag guy. That was me. <laughs> that was but, you. Uh, okay. It, it literally, if you applied the UCMJ literally, and it's not Miranda, it'd be Article 31 of the UCMJ, which is comparable to Miranda. But if you read it literally in the scenario you described, I think my recollection was you described they they put him across the hood of the jeep and want to ask him some questions. Literally, yes, that would require an Article 31 rights warning if you literally applied the UCMJ. Uh, but again, as I said, I don't think uh, I don't think constitutional rights apply. Okay. Okay. And, sir, very quickly, and I apologize to my colleagues for, uh, for taking as much time as I have. Go right ahead, sir, and then we'll move, I'll wrap up here. I, I don't believe Miranda rights are required. I don't believe the full range of constitutional rights extend extraterritorially to people who aren't U.S. citizens or who don't have ties to the United States that are substantial. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Oleski, I believe you are representing two petitioners at this point in time. Six uh, representatives, six. Brett. In six different procedures, six different well, it's cases? One, it's one case, but uh, because they were all arrested together in Bosnia. But uh, in effect, there are six separate cases within that one petition, yes. Now, we have a request from the Attorney General to the effect that Congress needs to intercede relating back to the finding, amongst other things, that the executive branch can't do this unilaterally on its own. It requires our working together and lawmaking capacity to create something like this. You seem to say, however, the courts can do it. If there's sufficient law, sufficient known procedures, sufficient precedent for the courts to proceed, and that's what's happening in the cases you are conducting, you're, where you're representing petitions at the present time. Yes, sir. And you're saying that uh, Judge Leon, is it, and Judge Hogan are blazing this path as they go along yeah. and haven't encountered any problems that require congressional intercession. That, that would be the way I read what they've done, and I've been following both their proceedings carefully. They are consolidating all the cases, uh, either, between, either with Judge Hogan or Judge Leon, uh, working out, as uh, Mr. Klinglow said, the common issues, and there are many common issues, and then coming to decisions on those common issues that will allow the cases to proceed to be heard as a trial in a habeas court. What kind of evidentiary hearing do you think there will be in this particular case? Well, that's, that's still to be worked out, but it seems clear from what the Supreme Court said that unlike what would have happened under the Detainee Treatment Act where the Circuit Court of Appeals could only review the CSRT record frozen in time, no matter what new evidence you had to present that might exonerate your client, that, the, that there's likely to be fact-finding by the district court judges based on evidence that will be offered that could tend to exonerate your client either to show that the wrong person's been held or that there's no authority to hold that person in the case of my clients because they weren't in Afghanistan, they weren't connected to 9-11, they had nothing to do with al-Qaeda. Those would be the kinds of facts, I think, that will be heard in these cases. How does the court propose to handle coerced testimony? Is there there's no, there's no uh, decision on that yet, but I would expect. You, have you made motions in Lemonade to? Not, not yet, uh, because we don't know what the government uh, is going to say. I think you need to understand that about uh, three weeks ago, the government suddenly said to all of us in the habeas cases that instead of relying on the records they filed from the CSRTs in 2004, they now want to amend all those records and add new claims against virtually everyone who's still at Guantanamo. So we don't know, as I sit here, what the claims will be against any particular person today, as opposed to the claims that were made in the sea certs, which led to the findings four years ago that they were enemy combatants. It's a very odd situation to be in and rather unfortunate, but the government seems inclined to try that, and we'll see whether the judges allow it. Now, if Congress decided that it needed to intercede to define coerced testimony, classified evidence, confrontation of witnesses, to go back and revisit some of the law we've passed in light of the Supreme Court decision. Would this delay the 
trial that you're now, the, the, the cases that you're now conducting? It certainly would delay our case because our judge has said that he intends to try every case in front of him by December 30 and that our case is the lead case. So we expect, based on what he said, that our case will be tried in October. It would seem unlikely, uh, as I sit here, that this legislation that, that uh, we're talking about hypothetically could work its way through all the committee process and the thoughtful hearings that people would want to give it and be out in time to be useful in our case. And that I, I believe that would be true for other cases as well that would be likely to advance rapidly in view of the Supreme Court's directive. Your clients don't appear to have been known combatants engaged in an ongoing conflict or I don't know if there's any allegation of association of al-Qaeda, Taliban, or anything of that nature. Appear, they appear to have been suspect of some kind of incipient terrorist activity. If they are acquitted or if the court cannot find satisfactory evidence to continue holding them, what's their status? Their status would be that the, the court could order them conditionally released, in the words of the Supreme Court, subject to the executive negotiating with, in their case, in the first instance, Bosnia, for their return to Bosnia under, ter under terms and conditions satisfactory to Bosnia and to the United States. That's what's been happening for the hundreds of men who've already been released. Our government's been negotiating with Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and other countries, and that's how these men have been released, not because of anything the courts have done, but because the executive has decided it's right and appropriate to release those men for whatever reasons. And the lawyers who are testifying before you haven't been a part of that process. That's all been done by the executive branch. And that's how the releases of anybody cleared in habeas would have to be accomplished as far as I can determine. Uh, Professor Katyal, you seem to be recognize the need for more structure and express concern that in Congress doesn't act and create better structure that the whole process is likely to come unravel in different courts and different rulings and different uh, decisions. I do. I think that this is an unprecedented system that's going on at Guantanamo. And if our desire is to actually bring justice to the victims of 9-11 who suffered so much in the horrible attacks, we want a system that works, that's going to sustain, that's going to be sustained over the long term. And what we have instead is a system that's woefully deficient on paper and in practice and is likely to get struck down. And so I think that this body does need to pause these military commissions, take a deep breath, and figure out what do we really want our trial system to look like, and let's figure out what structural guarantees should we put in place to make sure it stands the test of time and meets out justice. Are you concerned about the delays it may cause and the concerns on the part of uh, counsel like uh, Mr. Oleski that I uh, could deny his his clients uh, speedy justice. Oh, I'm deeply concerned about that. I certainly don't think that Congress should interfere with the ongoing process at this point in habeas corpus hearings that are on that that judges in the Washington D.C. courts are undertaking at this moment. I think we should actually use that as a basis for legislation, if any, in the future. But with respect to the military commissions, uh, this novel, unprecedented system, yes, I think they need to be put on pause now, which is the fastest way to meet out justice because we're going to have these trials, we're going to have years of appeals, the system's going to get struck down, and we'll all be at the starting point once again in 2012, 13, something like that with no convictions. We're seven and a half years after 9-11, six and a half years after 9-11, only half of one trial has taken place at Guantanamo. The system keeps getting struck down because there's a rush to judgment. And instead, I think it's important to take a pause and adopt a durable system instead. Thank you very much, Dr. Gingry. Five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> My question is going to be directed toward Mr. Klingler, but let me kind of set the stage first. Those before us today argue in favor of more rights for the terrorist detainees, implying that their detention is motivated by something other than a simple desire by the President and like-minded Americans to keep our nation safe. We are trying to balance the rights of these detainees as human beings with the rights of the American people 
to be safe and secure. We have bent over backwards to protect the, ta the, ta uh, the detainees' rights, providing them with a forum to challenge their status and detention, which, by the way, I think goes beyond the Geneva Conventions, which do not bestow rights to challenge detention or the opportunity to be released prior to the end of hostilities on the POWs. Many of those we are continually seeking to confer uh, more and more rights upon <clears throat> have been involved with terrorist groups that have absolutely no respect for Geneva or international law. In fact, they behead prisoners, they fight out of uniform, they hide amongst women and children. My question is, where, where does it stop? How far is the liberal elite going to go to ensure that the terrorist detainees have all the rights afforded American citizens under the Constitution? This is the same group of people who want to make it more difficult for us to listen to the foreign communications of suspected terrorists, thus more difficult to prevent terrorist attacks, while at the same time continuing to provide more rights to those who do commit these acts. Mr. Klingler, this is absolutely appalling to me. Does the review process currently in place provide the detainees the ability to challenge their detention? And do you believe that those we capture trying to kill us should in turn be provided the rights reserved for American citizens under the Constitution? There's a series of ways that detainees can assert their Mr. rights. Mr. Klinger, if you don't mind, if you'll turn that mic directly toward your mouth, Thank I you. would appreciate it. Is that better? That's better. Uh, there are a series of ways that detainees can now press their rights in federal court. I think the main issue is how broad those rights should be and what interests should be taken into account in figuring out the scope and breadth of those rights. I would focus on two things. One is the point that you're making, the extent to which uh, the detainees are U.S. citizens or have ties to the United States. For the detainees at issue, they don't. And traditionally, and under established Supreme Court precedents for particular components of the Constitution, they don't have the same degree of underlying substantive rights. Now, that affects particularly the military commission process. The second area of discussion surrounds the habeas proceedings themselves. And there, they clearly do have habeas rights. The question there is, then how do you conduct those proceedings in a way that legitimately reflects the military and national security interests at stake? And there, it's a question of what type of hearing we're going to have. Is it going to be a trial-like hearing, a show hearing that really brings into question a whole range of issues surrounding Guantanamo that are extraneous to the immediate issues before the court in terms of the substantive evidence supporting detention? Uh, and is there going to be a wide latitude for judicial policy making in that context? Or as the government's argued in before Judge Hogan, is it going to be a relatively straightforward process? And then the third is the um, review process that's still on the books in relation to uh, the federal court review of the CSER process. And there the Attorney General has suggested that um, that is highly duplicative of the habeas proceedings and needn't proceed. And I understand the government is seeking to have those at least held in abeyance, and I think that that would be appropriate. In the few seconds I've got left, let me ask you a follow-up. Does the right of the terrorist detainees to confront their accuser mean they need to be brought to America? Do we have to bring soldiers out of combat, as an example, so the detainees get to confront their accuser? Well, I would argue that the right of confrontation is a, is a criminal right that wouldn't apply in the habeas context at all and that it would be perfectly appropriate for courts to uh, allow that evidence to be presented through hearsay evidence rather than pulling uh, American soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan. And finally, uh, if the courts force the release of certain detainees, can they be released in the United States? Do judges have the right to say where they can be released? Uh, that's, that's an open issue. I think that that uh, is very possible, uh, and I expect that the detainees' lawyers will argue that. Thank you very much, Dr. Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for you 
uh, sitting at that table that are defense attorneys in this business, I hope that you won't uh, go out of here thinking you're going to have opportunities at some time to use the Miranda uh, absence as a way to get your uh, your clients off the hook. There is not now, nor has there ever been, any interest by any member of Congress in applying the Miranda warnings to the battlefield, and I don't know why that topic keeps coming up. It was a red hearing. Every year it's been brought up since this war began, and uh, there's not any point in talking about it. When you, would no, the gentleman no, just Mr. yield on that no, for one no, second? No, Mr. Duncan. It's, it's 5 to 12. Most of us have been here for almost two hours. Uh, w the clock finally has been working after an hour and 15 minutes. It wasn't used. I, I want to take the remaining time I have. You'll have all the time, unlimited time you want to when the rest of us are done. I, I, let me please finish my question because I don't have Well, then uh, if the gentleman is going to bring up an issue that I, that I brought up and he wants to, he uh, wants to discuss Mr. it in a Chairman, meaningful way, I, I hope he would give me the opportunity to respond to it because uh, that, that issue was brought up and that was offered the, as a part uh, the, of the UCNJ. Mr. Chairman, I would respect the, the request the, that my five minutes be begun anew. And, and I would second his request. I think that's fine. Start the clock over again. Thank you very much. There. No. I'll repeat what I had said, which is there is no interest in this Congress in applying any Miranda warning to the battlefield. And if anyone were to apply it, I can assure you that every member of Congress and the American people would be shocked and would not want that. So don't, you defense attorneys, don't take heart by anything said here today. Uh, Colonel Davis, what I wanted to ask you about was uh, in, in your s statement, I, I sense almost almost hopelessness that the military commissions can ever be revived with the integrity that you thought they would have at the beginning of it. But you, a, a, a glimmer of hope, and you give four suggestions about how to give them. And I want to re read what you say in your statement. One of them is ensure the independence of each component in the military commission process. Another one, make openness and transparency of the proceedings an imperative. The fourth one, expressly reject the use of evidence obtained by undue coercion it's the first one that concerns me the most here, in which you say, put the military back into military commissions and take the politics out. And in your written statement, you provide to us, and you're very clear, you highlight, take the politics out. And unfortunately, we've had over the last several years too many examples in our justice system in this country of, of political influence, just most recently in the report that has just come out in the last few days, in which uh, uh, officials in the Justice Department uh, have been castigated by the Justice Department for political influence. Uh, and Monica Gidling, I think, has been very candid about her having stepped over the line, and she, she, this, this obviously is not over yet. As I read your written statement, you, you, you're at least implying, if not alleging, that you thought there was political influence being exerted leading up to the 2006 congressional elections in this country and then also that political influence was being exerted perhaps to help uh, Prime Minister Howard in Australia, who uh, subsequently lost his election. Is that your allegation here? Yes, sir. I think, and I think I described in the statement, uh, it was September, I believe, 28th of 2006. It was when Deputy Secretary of Defense Gordon England, right after the high-value detainees were transferred to DOD custody, said that there could be strategic political value in getting some of them charged quickly, which was, you know, weeks before the November midterm elections. I think in your written statement you said it was six weeks before, before the, the 2006 right. election. You know, I, I think uh, you're all, Mr. Hunter has been very eloquent today, as have some of you, about th the importance of these, uh, these uh, trials. Is It's not just our safety, it's bringing justice to those families that uh, lost so many people on uh, September 11, 2001. And, and to see this process, you may not be right, Colonel Davis, you're a very well-respected man, you may not be right in your allegation, uh, but I think, Mr. Chairman, this al these allegations concern me as much as anything we've read today, that it's not just some political point, he's stepping in in the spirit of, Colonel Davis, you're not doing this job well enough, but stepping in in the spirit of trying to influence an ally's election or trying to influence uh, the congressional election. I, I, I don't know where this aspect of this hearing today is going to go, but uh, it's very concerning to hear a man of your um, experience and the position that you held in, in Guantanamo uh, make those kinds of allegations. 
Uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield any remaining time I have to Mr. Hunter for any comments he wants to make about the Miranda warnings. Well, I, I, I thank uh, my uh, colleague for yielding and simply say to my colleague uh, that that was uh, that when we had our testimony with respect to what body of law we were going to follow when we put together the MCA, we had witnesses who testified that they thought that the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, was the right blueprint. Now, it was important for us to establish what ramifications that would have. And when I asked the question, what would that mean on the battlefield? In fact, the very colonel you have in front of you here, who I think you find to have some good degree of credibility, testified if we adopted that. And you may recall that was actually recommended by several members of the Senate who were uh, initial architects of the bill, that we follow the UCMJ. He testified to us, he said, you can't do that. Or he said, if you do it, you are going to require Miranda on the battlefield. So that's not a red herring that's thrown up uh, um, as a matter of, uh, of uh, something that's trivial to the discussion. That was, a, that was a real ramification of a substantive direction that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was testified to by witnesses and recommended by some of the architects of the bill. We are now looking at some expansions that may take place in terms of, of the rights of the accused. So I think it's an, it's an absolutely appropriate question to ask him. But I thank the gentleman for yielding to me so, so that I might uh, describe that. Your time has expired, uh, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you very much. We're a very blessed people. We are one person out of 22 in the world. But we have a fourth of all the good things in the world. I've often asked myself the question, why? It's certainly not because we have the world's best work ethic. All you have to do is look at some of the immigrants that are among us, and that will be clear. It's not because we have the most focus on technical education. This year, India will graduate three times as many engineers as we graduate, and China will graduate six times as many engineers as we graduate. It's not because we have the most commitment to the nuclear family. Nearly half of our children are born out of wedlock. There may be other reasons, but I think that it's largely because of our enormous commitment to civil liberties. There is no other constitution or no other Bill of Rights in the world that comes close to ours. I think this has created, established an environment in which creativity and entrepreneurship can flourish. To deny these rights, I think, puts at risk that we can continue to be who we are. If we set aside these great constitutional guarantees, even for national security reasons, have we not admitted that the enemy has already won? And the most important security of all, the insurance of our civil liberties, is seriously at risk because who next, by edict, might be denied these great constitutional guarantees? Therefore, I was very dismayed by our Gitmo statement that one, since the de detainees were unlawful combatants, they should not be afforded the protections of the Geneva Conventions. I don't know how they thought to get around Geneva for. And two, since they were not on US soil, the constitutional protections did not apply. One might logically conclude from these statements that we intended to treat these detainees in ways precluded by the Geneva Conventions and our Constitution. The constitutional issue seemed very clear to me. If they were under our control, no matter where they were physically, our Constitution applied. Even if I agreed that unlawful combatants should not be afforded Geneva Convention protection, how can I know that they are unlawful combatants minus a court trial that found them so? My declaring them so doesn't make it so. Does not the simple declaration that, that a detainee is an unlawful combatant violate our treasured presumption of innocence? If we affirm our right to do this, even for national security reasons, have we not put at risk the, the rights of all of us because by simple edict, in some future emergency, any of our constitutional protections could be set aside. 
Where have I gone wrong in my thinking? That's a question to me, is it? Uh, I agree with most of what you said. I think that uh, national security should not trump constitutional rights. I think, though, that uh, what is at issue is what the scope of those constitutional rights are. I don't think, and I don't think that the court's precedents uh, support the conclusion that simply because a person is under the control of the U.S. military or even uh, at Guantanamo, outside of the United States proper, that the full range of constitutional rights apply. I direct you to uh, Bredego Urquidez and the cases cited there, some of the insular cases. So the issue isn't balancing or setting aside constitutional rights, but ensuring that there is a clear understanding of what those are and that there isn't an assumption that simply because the suspension clause has been held to apply to Guantanamo that the full range of constitutional rights does so. I don't think that's what the Supreme Court said. I don't think that's how you can fairly read the decision. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Loretta Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being before us. I know some of you have been before us before. Um, you know, I, I think we find ourselves in this position because it really was the job of the Congress to provide for a structure for the military commissions, and we just didn't do it. We allowed the administration to do it. I think I believe they did a bad job of it. I know that I had legislation and a bill drawn many years before we ever got to the MC, uh, the Military Commissions Act, and asked both the chairman and the ranking member at that time to give us a hearing on it, and unfortunately it didn't happen. Um, after three, three court rulings, including Supreme Court rulings with Hamden, all of a sudden we realized it was our job, Article One, Section 8, to do this. Um, and we put forward an MCA, one which I voted against, by the way, in particular because of the habeas issue. So here we come back again with the same issue. In fact, I had some legislation, um, a revised bill, H.R. 2543, which we've been revising uh, with this latest court case to address some of the problems created by the MCA. And Justice Kennedy, in his majority opinion, invites us, us, the Congress, to find innovative solutions. That's on page 67 of the opinion. And he also states that certain accommodations can be made to reduce the burden of habeas proceedings which will, that are placed on the military without impermissibly diluting protections of the writ. And that's also on page 67. So I think we, knew, we do need to address this. And at the same time, I believe that we must give due deference to military and intelligence considerations in defining the terms and the procedures that will govern the writ going forward. You all were just asked, and with the exception of the first gentleman who was wanted to know more circumstantial issues, you all agreed that the writ does not extend to Afghanistan, for example. So if the administration closes Gitmo, and moves the detainees to a detention facility in Afghanistan, detention under our U.S. Army, for example, would they then be beyond the writ of habeas? Can the administration avoid the ruling, this recent ruling, simply by moving the detainees back to Afghanistan, where many of them were captured? And I want to say that this is a very important, pertinent question, because there are many, including members of this Congress, who continue for the call to close Gitmo. And I have always felt that closing Gitmo would mean the transfer of these detainees back to Afghanistan, where they would have uh, less access to the media, because it's a combat zone, less access to this Congress as the overseer to some of this, again, because it's a combat zone, um, less access to the International Red Cross and others. So would these prisoners also be deprived of habeas if they were moved back to Afghanistan? That's my question for all of you. 
Let me, let me take the first uh, crack at that, Congresswoman. Uh, the court now has jurisdiction over, uh, the habeas courts have jurisdiction over everyone in Guantanamo, uh, as far as I know. I don't think that the courts would permit the executive unilaterally to move people within its jurisdiction on pending habeas cases to Afghanistan or anywhere with the intent of ousting the jurisdiction of the courts. And I don't believe that the executive would do that understanding and knowing that these cases are pending. I think Secretary Gates has made uh, many important statements about his views of Guantanamo. There's nothing in what he says that leads me to believe that he would be a party to any such action. So while it's a theoretical possibility, I don't think the administration would do it. It would set up a conflict with the courts that would be uh, very damaging. And I think if it was attempted, that the courts would act to prevent it. Let me begin by thanking you for your historic leadership on these issues. I wish that Congress had listened to you many years ago. We would have had trials underway in a system that would have been stable. Um, and instead, we find ourselves seven and a half years later, six and a half years later, without a trial taking place. With respect to closing Guantanamo, uh, I don't think the reason to close Guantanamo is really just about human rights of the detainees. It's about America's self-interest. As Secretary Rice and Secretary Gates have said, Guantanamo is a foreign policy disaster. And so I think the reasons for closing it are not as much about the detainees, but about us. I think if the, de in the detainees who are currently there are moved outside to an area outside of court control, I do think that the federal courts may have something to say about it with respect to those current detainees. What uh, about the future of somebody in action, caught in the same way, and now held in the prison in Afghanistan, controlled by the U.S. military, even though there are Afghan laws, those necessarily wouldn't apply to our facility holding somebody who's a combatant supposedly against us. I, I, precisely correct. That is, and I think that's happening now, that is there aren't many detainees being brought, brought to Guantanamo. And the reason Guantanamo exists, the reason we used it in 2001, wasn't because the military liked the weather, it was because the Bush administration had a legal fiction that they could bring people there and have them outside of the control of the United States courts. Now the Supreme Court has emphatically rejected that idea, so Guantanamo has outlived its usefulness in terms of being an escape from federal court processes. The, the gentlelady's time has expired. The monitor's not working, but time's up. I love being called on that <laughs> after <laughs> waiting for two hours. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You bet. Five minutes, Mr. Burcham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank the panel for being here today. Um, I would start by saying, uh, Colonel Davis, thank you for your service to our country, and I think it's very appropriate that today in your opening testimony you cited the prosecutor for the World War II saboteurs who said that, uh, he said this in 2001 in his op-ed, as you mentioned, that how we prosecute Al-Qaeda members will say just as much about us as it will say about those Al-Qaeda members. Um, the petitioners in the uh, Boumediene case specifically asked the court to make a ruling on exactly who the administration can indefinitely hold as an unlawful enemy combatant uh, pursuant to the 2001 authorization of the use of military force. The court, however, has been silent on that issue. In subsequent cases after the Boumediene, they make their way through the courts, such as the Almari case and the Parrot case. It is becoming increasingly clear to uh, this Congress, and myself specifically, that we'll have to re-examine this question in the near future. Uh, Mr. Oleski, as counsel in the, in the Boumediene case, let me ask you, in your opinion, does the 2001 AUMF allow the President to detain in perpetuity someone who has, no, has little to no tangential connection to Al-Qaeda and who has not engaged in any belligerent acts against the United States? And a follow-up, does the Constitution give the President this authority? Uh, I think that uh, the Supreme Court hasn't spoken definitively to the second point, so we don't know what they'll say, but it would be my view that the, uh, the implication of Boumediene is that the Constitution does not give the President the, in the authority to, in to indefinitely detain someone uh, suspected or accused of terrorist activity. The Constitution and our statutory scheme say there is a criminal justice system, and if there is terrorist activity that's not 
uh, that disqualifies you from POW status, then you then you indict the person, and we've had many examples of successful indictments and and uh, and prosecutions. So uh, I think uh, that uh, that's where we're headed on the second question. And your first question again was, well, uh, one does the Constitution give the president the authority to do so, and then. Um, I think the better view is that uh, you and the Congress intended to give the President limited authority to go after people directly involved in the atrocity of September 11th. Instead, I think what the cases show is the administration used that language to pick up people all over the world on a variety of bases, uh, many of them people who appear to be innocent of any wrongdoing at all, others of whom may have had some activity with radical groups that had nothing to do with September 11th. The great strength of the habeas process that we're now at last embarked upon is it should sort out who those people are and if they have a connection to September 11th and that's within the authorization, then they presumably will continue to be held and some of those people, as we've been discussing, will be the subject of military commissions where they may be found guilty or may not. The rest uh, ought to be found, if they're not connected to September 11th and not within that resolution, to be ordered release subject to the executive's right to negotiate their return to some place that's safe for them and for us. Yeah, and I think that as the panel understands up, up here and, and as the members understand, obviously this is new case law coming out. We're looking at, as today is July the 30th, uh, we've had two significant cases. Obviously the Power Hack case where we're talking about the 17 Chinese and that Almari case where we're talking about the citizen of the Qatar who was a U.S. resident. So to follow up on my first question, if the Power Hack decision and the Almari decisions, especially considering the opinion uh, of Judge Wilkerson, who I think we would all agree is a conservative, but the Senate in this case, and very well respected, especially considering his opinion of Judge Wilkerson, if that's any guide, the administration's broad definition of who can be indefinitely detained under the AUMF is going to be struck down as either unconstitutional or more likely, in my opinion, uh, outside the authorization of the AUMF. If that is the case, it is possible that many detainees held at Gitmo and those held at other U.S. military facilities around the world are going to be released unless the courts and the Congress of the United States come up with a new legal framework for deciding who will be detained. So, Mr. Lesky, if the court holds that the administration is acting outside the scope of the AUMF, how do you see a path forward for this Congress to work in a bipartisan manner to reach a new legal and constitutionally valid framework that ensures that we are detaining those who are the most culpable and pose the greatest risk, while not, as Judge Wilkinson, I think, astutely noted, uh, breaching this country's most fundamental values. If you could comment, I would appreciate it. I think that's a, that's a fair point. I, I remember that back when these cases were working their way up, Judge Green in the district court asked the uh, de Deputy Solicitor General, suppose a little old lady in Switzerland is asked to send money to an orphanage in Afghanistan. She doesn't know it's an Al-Qaeda front, but American intelligence does. Do you say the AUMF, Mr. Deputy, allows her to be seized in Switzerland by the American military, taken to Guantanamo and held indefinitely? And the answer was yes, that's the government's position. So I agree with the premise of your question, Congressman. The definition has been treated by the administration as hugely overbroad and misused. In terms of what, what happens, I think I disagree with Professor Katchel on the special courts that he's been advocating. Uh, I think the criminal justice system is perfectly competent to deal with people who've committed crimes against the United States. That the crimes are unconnected with 9-11 doesn't make them any less crimes if they're uh, within the scope of our federal criminal statutes such as the bombing of the USS Cole, the Cobalt Towers bombings in Saudi Arabia, the first bombing of the U.S. World Trade Center. Those are all examples of how our criminal laws can deal with and have dealt effectively with people who've committed legitimate terrorist actions. Whether there's any role for Congress to play, I think, is a matter that, will, that I would at least like to see you wait on while some of these habeas cases go forward and we see what the facts are and what the judges do. After that, as Mr. Katchel and others have suggested here today, there may be a role for Congress to weigh in deliberately, as your question suggests, with a thoughtful approach to redefinition. I don't think that would be useful now because we have a process that at long last is underway in which facts are going to be found very soon 
by experienced federal judges. Thanks, sir. Would anyone else in the panel like to comment? Colonel? I, I think if you try to treat these as ordinary criminal cases, it's a naive approach. These are not, these guys didn't rob the corner liquor store. Uh, I think there's a war component to this. I was not a fan of, there are a number of folks that have pitched national security courts in some form or another. Uh, initially, you I was can not continue to answer. I, I just can't answer anything else. No, no, go ahead and answer the question. Okay. I'll, initially, I was not a huge fan of it. I still think the Military Commissions Act was a pretty good piece of legislation that if it was implemented properly, could render fair trials. I'm beginning to come around to the National Security Court concept. What I would like to see, I think there is a war component to terrorism. It's not your ordinary Title 18 type of crime. It would be a National Security Court that combines both military and federal uh, judges and takes the best aspects of the Military Commissions Act, the SEPA procedures, and federal and military law. Because you know, I think what, you know, we keep talking about Guantanamo, and that's the immediate you know, issue in front of us, but I think this is a longer term issue, and whatever the solution is, it needs to address the Guantanamo problem plus terrorism you know, over, a, over, over a longer perspective. And again, I think Guantanamo is grossly mischaracterized. I mean, I, I used to be a bail bondsman, so I've seen a lot of jails. It's a pretty decent place, but it's become such an, uh, a blight on the country that perhaps it is worth closing it just to or try to erase that stain. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Jim. <coughs> You'll note the monitor is working again. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Cummings. Um, the, uh, I direct this to uh, all of you, or whoever wants to answer. First of all, I think it's very important that, um, and I know you all share this, that we uh, safeguard our Constitution and uh, the rights under that Constitution. Um, I think this is our watch, and we have a, a duty to do that. B Boumediene suggested that habeas corpus m might not be constitutionally required if there were suitable alternative processes in place to protect against the arbitrary exercise of governmental power. As such, do you believe that the comprehensive protective laws governing prisoners of war under the third Geneva Convention, which the United States has decided is in, inapplicable to members or affiliates of Al Qaeda or the Taliban, but which would be applicable in almost any conceivable future armed conflict against another nation state should be applied to detainees, particularly those suspected of being affiliated with Al Qaeda or the Taliban. If you do believe that such obligations should be afforded to these individuals, what dangers exist in the United States failing to ensure that these detainees' rights are protected as POWs? How can we ensure as a nation that we are balancing our priority of protecting our nation from any prospective act of terrorism? Something that we must do while ensuring that current detainees, even those that may be allegedly associated with terrorist organizations, are provided with the protections that they are deemed to have under international humanitarian law and customary law. I'd say if the administration had adhered to the Geneva Conventions, uh, we wouldn't have had these Supreme Court cases and we wouldn't be having this hearing today. We'd have a very different kind of situation. Um, if, as I said earlier, if there are people who've committed violations of international law and American law, there are recognized procedures to follow. The military commissions are, are being uh, criticized here by lots of us for not providing adequate protection. But the same people uh, on the panel and in the Congress who are criticizing that process are recognizing, as your question does, that we need some way to protect the United States against terrorists and ensure that they don't commit crimes again. So whether it's an enhanced military commission, whether it's a special national security court, there's nothing inconsistent with those approaches to effectively criminalizing terrorist behavior in a different way, in a different process, and still treating people who are not put before those proceedings as POWs in accordance with international law. So I take the premise of your question to be 
that we can both protect the country and respect our international obligations in a way that makes us, again, a beacon for the world in these areas and not the embarrassment we have become because of Guantanamo, and I agree with the premise. Well, going back to something that Mr. Davis uh, wrote in his testimony, and he talked about how uh, criminals were punishing and sort of after the fact, and these detainees are sort of before the fact. We're trying to prevent. And, you know, I guess that does present a very different kind of set of circumstances um, when you are trying to prevent something from happening as opposed to saying you did something and now we're going to punish you. And I, I'm just trying to figure out where, where did that concept come from, that prevent concept? Well, in, in uh, the law of war, it comes mm -hmm. to the notion that an enemy soldier can be lawfully held during the duration of the conflict so that he cannot return to the battlefield. Mm -hmm. But what the administration has said is that the whole world's a battlefield, not just Afghanistan or Iraq, and therefore anybody picked up who can be claimed to be a member of some radical group or terrorist group or to know somebody who is or to provide some support, however innocently, to that group can be held as if they were a POW for the duration of the war on terror, which, as Justice O'Connor said, back in 2004, could be for the rest of your life. So that preventive function that comes out of the law of war doesn't apply as the administration has applied it, and that's why we've had these cases. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank the gentleman, Mr. Hunter. <coughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and gentlemen, uh, thanks for being with us and for spending as much time as you have. Uh, and, and of course, it, uh, uh, this is a uh, very timely that you're, that you're with us. But we've got this problem. Uh, you've got uh, the habeas right has been, uh, has been uh, extended by the Supreme Court decision. Uh, and you have the prospects now of habeas being applied for uh, in, in presumably uh, before many, many uh, federal courts by many uh, folks who are presently detained. And the question is, uh, is it appropriate for us at this point to have a direction uh, to, to put together some guidelines I noticed, uh, I think it's uh, the, uh, the, the D.C. Circuit said if Congress is going to do this, uh, uh, now's the time because uh, it looks like we're going to have, uh, we're going to have the need for directions. I'm paraphrasing, but, uh, uh, but that's essentially their statement. You know, if you look at the, uh, if you're a, a court that's been petitioned for habeas, and uh, let's say you have a guy who says, you know, I was, uh, I was picked up on a sweep in, in a firefight in, uh, in an Afghan village and uh, I was apprehended because I had an AK and, or I had some ammo and, and the reason I had that is because I'm part of an ad hoc security service or I'm out uh, protecting, the, uh, protecting the, the, uh, uh, the flock of sheep that, are, uh, that this particular uh, village maintains and, uh, and, and I got picked up uh, wrongly. Uh, in a way, the, uh, the farmer in the field uh, uh, argument that uh, that has been made a lot of times at Guantanamo. In fact, we've released a number of people at Guantanamo, as as the colonel knows. S a few of them went back and picked up arms against us. So we we made a mistake in that case. Uh, we uh, uh, we were too lenient uh, and made a mistake of judgment. But my point is, let's that's thrust in the lap of a federal court. Now here's a court in the United States, and and the habeas. Uh, and, and, and they ask, uh, they, they, uh, they hold a little prayer meeting with their staff and their uh, judges and say, how do we conduct this? Uh, what is our, uh, what's the extent of our review? Do we try to get villagers from this small village uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan? Do we try to pull back uh, members of the military who are in that particular uh, uh, squad from the 10th Mountain Division that made this sweep? Uh, it looks to me like it's going to be a very, very, without a, without a prescription for, for how far they look and what they do and whether or not they have essentially a, a trial on the merits, it looks to me like you're going to have, uh, you're going to have 101 different recipes uh, by different courts as they try to figure out what we want them to do in terms of a habeas review. So uh, 
what are your thoughts on this? How do you, uh, do, you do you think there's a there's a danger of having going off in 50 different directions if we don't have a prescription or a recipe or a, a set of directions as to as to how the court proceeds on this or how the courts proceed on this? Let me uh, begin by saying I don't think that there's some immediate crisis. We're only a month or so after the Supreme Court's Spumetian decision. I think we should let that process play out, as Mr. Oleski says, with experienced federal judges, and that will then inform what this body does. I'm very worried about the number of misperceptions uh, that have happened in this debate thus far in the past month. I mean, uh, Representative Hunter, you know more about this issue than almost anyone, and yet you open the hearing today by saying, and I, I think I'm getting this quote exactly right, the right to habeas corpus is something no American soldier enjoys. But of course, since 1890, in the Inree Grimley decision, the Supreme Court has extended habeas corpus rights to American soldiers. No, no, not, not as a POW. As American soldiers have habeas corpus rights. They can't be POWs because they are, after all, our own soldiers. No, so I, but I'm talking about an American soldier who is a POW held in another country. And presumably, I would think that would apply to POWs who are in other, other uh, militaries. We don't have, we don't have, we had our German camps and our, uh, uh, of, uh, of soldiers in this country. Did we allow them to have habeas? If you're talking about um, other soldiers, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I'm talking your of, statement yes. was about, I thought you had said a couple of times that American soldiers did not well, have habeas corpus rights. And American soldiers. That, that's exactly what I meant. Okay, Amer American an American soldier held as a POW doesn't have that right. Extend, obviously, it would be extended by another country, nor do we, to my knowledge, extend that right to to other soldiers when they are a POW of our country. In other words, a POW, whether you whether you say he's a German POW, an Italian POW, an American POW, does not have that right. And yet, people who are essentially soldiers in this war against terror now have, according to this 5-4 decision, have a habeas right. So we have extended a right which hasn't extended to combatants in a in a war. Uh, Sir, okay. in, in the uh, ex parte Curran decision in World War II, the Supreme Court extended the writ of habeas corpus both to Americans and to enemies, Nazi saboteurs. So it's been around for a while. Those um, were not soldiers. They, they, they were enemy, unlawful they enemy They were not combatants. soldiers, and were they? they were and so the point that I made was absolutely accurate. Okay. And, I, and that's part of, and I'm not, I'm not trying to beat you down, but that's the, the problem we have here. You have a soldier, let's say he's in Saddam Hussein's army, and he shoots at Americans with his AK-47. He has a certain bundle of rights, but a very limited bundle of rights when he's captured. That same person now decides he's going to be a terrorist, and he sheds a uniform, and he does something against American troops, and he ends up in Guantanamo. He now has a very different bundle of rights, indeed one that we're defining right now with this 15, this list of of rights that people have under the DCA Act. So my point is, in ways, it's, it's interesting that in ways we've expanded the rights for people who, have, uh, who, who are killing Americans in battlefields and who are engaging in, in what heretofore, in some cases, was, a, was a, a war that was undertaken by people in uniform. And that's why I think, and that's why I brought up the point and the, and the Colonel buttressed this point, when we had members of Congress who said, let's give a UCMJ right, that's why we brought up the fact that, in fact, that did indeed encompass certain things like Miranda that would now have to be attached to that person's bundle of rights. So my question is, you're a, you're a federal judge. You got, you've extended a habeas right to a person who says, I was caught up in this sweep in this remote village. Aren't you going to have a real difficulty because much of whether or not that person was here is now being lawfully held turns on the facts. And the facts are whether or not he was, in fact, protecting the sheep with his AK-47, uh, protecting the herd, and he was caught up in a sweep. He was a farmer in a field, and he was not purposefully uh, attacking American forces as the rest of the people were. That's going to depend on the facts and the ability of that court to retrieve those facts from a battlefield situation which dissipated years ago, I think is going to be very difficult as a practical matter. Don't you agree with that, that that's going to be tough to do? Courts can always appoint special masters. They have that existing power to go, and, and so they could have a military apparatus do the first cut of that. 
My fundamental point okay, is Okay, but now let me, I, wanna, I want you to answer this question, though. You can appoint all the masters you want, but how do you, in a real sense, ascertain what the facts were three years ago in a remote village in Afghanistan as to whether or not this guy really had a rifle or not? And that's what or had a rifle that he was using against Americans. That's my question. And that's what we warned about three years ago and five years ago. Let's have a system in place, that's the Geneva Conventions, to do that initial sorting. But, uh, we didn't do that, and so now we find ourselves in a, in a, in a mess. But you haven't sense. answered the practical question. We're at where we are, and you're now going to have habeas proceedings. How will a federal court today, someplace in the United States, be able to reach back and retrieve facts so that th they can give this this uh, defendant a fair hearing on whether or not he was picked up in a sweep and in fact was not part of, an I of a body of illegal combatants. We have experienced federal judges with investigative tools and the power to use special masters. Let's let that system play out and see what happens instead of just cutting them off at the get-go and saying, you're incapable of doing this. Well, I think, I'm not thinking, saying we have to be tell them they're incapable, but once again, you've used the statement special masters and they have certain powers. In a practical sense, it's going to be difficult, I think, to do that and give the guy a fair shot at if he wants to have essentially a little trial on the facts as to whether or not he was illegally picked up. You're going to have to be able to reach back and get people who have long since uh, dissipated from the battlefield scene. And, and let me ask the other gentlemen what they think about that. Do you think that's going to be practical to be able to have without without guidelines to have all these federal courts trying to come up with what they think is a fair habeas proceeding? Or do you think, think we should let it go and see if they can do it? Sir, I think the, I think the court in Boumediene, I think, reluctantly got into the fray. I mean, I think, had, as they said, had there been a viable, meaningful process in place to determine, you know, who's the sheep herder from who's the terrorist, you know, who really is the enemy? Had there been a meaningful process in place, I don't think the court would have intervened. But we're stuck now with, uh, you know, the court inserting itself into this process. So I think, you know, had we a year ago fixed the CSERT process to make it a meaningful review, we might not be sitting here today. But well, we I know, but we are here today, Colonel. Right. So what do we do? Well, I think, I think again, I think you've got to look at, number one, you know, the immediate issue is Gitmo. And what do we do with the 265 guys sitting at Gitmo? But the solution has to be bigger than that. Is what do we do with the next group that comes along behind that? So, you know, Gitmo is the immediate problem, but this is really requires a long-term solution. And there needs to be a robust, meaningful process to sort out the enemy from the... But see, in the end, what you're going to have is basically battlefield reports, which are very sketchy. Mm -hmm. They're not detailed. Uh, Mr. Klingler, do you have any uh, comments? You think this is going to be doable by the federal courts? I think the courts have already asked for some help in this. The questions that they've already posed indicate that there are tremendously difficult issues in front of them. The pleadings that have been filed already indicate tremendous divergence in whether we're going to have something approaching a full-blown trial or something that's very streamlined and efficient. I do think that there's a path through this. I think it needs legislative help. I think it is the congressional imprimatur on standards of deferring to the government and the military's determinations once they put forth a substantial degree of evidence and a streamlining of the process to avoid the questions that you're and the difficulties that you're pointing to. I, I, would, I would say, Representative, that the problem has been so far that all the issues that we've confronted have been abstract legal principles. Does habeas extend? Where does it extend? Now we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road, which is what trial judges do. They sort out the facts. I acknowledge the premise of your question. There will be some cases where the facts are difficult. The Supreme Court already said in 2004 that perhaps you'd have to have something called a declaration in that case, which would summarize the evidence, subject to limited cross-examination of the person making the declaration. But that is what courts do. And the notion that we can give you enough wisdom here to figure out a template for 275 cases to resolve the disgrace that the Guantanamo has become, correctly or not, I think is far-fetched. Let that process go on. Let the facts get sorted out. Judges can handle these issues, as Professor Katchel said. If out of that mix, the whole system still cries out for a legislative fix, then I think you should take another look at it. Yes. You don't think there's a problem with having, uh, with, with having uh, all these uh, different federal courts without us laying out a template for how you do this? Uh, you don't think there's a problem with, uh, with these courts going off in a lot of different directions? 
we've all agreed that the evidence in a lot of cases will be very, very skimpy because it's, come, it's not coming from a crime scene, it's coming from a battlefield. And so if you have a court that says, what if you have a court that says, you know, I can't give this guy a fair trial because I can't find anybody in that village, we can't retrieve any of them, we can't ascertain who was in that marine unit or where they are, so we think we gotta let him go. Is that, is that a possibility? Well, as you, as you pointed out, uh, and as we all acknowledge, more people have been released from Guantanamo by executive uh, decisions without any input from any habeas lawyers or courts than the men who are still there. But to your central premise, I think I disagree. There's only one federal court hearing these cases by design. That's the United States District Court in Washington, D.C., right down the street. There's only one circuit that will hear these habeas appeals, the D.C. Circuit, which is already weighed in mm -hmm. under the DTA and the habeas. So you, so you think they'll come up with a, with a, uh, a fairly, uh, with a good structure? I think they'll come up with a thoughtful approach and that will, since it's being run through only two judges, command uh, respect and uh, conformity by the other judges. And if they were wrong, there'll be an appeal. And at that point, when it appears there's still a dispute about some basic legal principle, as opposed to the facts about whether a man was a sheep herd or a rifleman, then you may decide to get involved, yes. But I think now is not that time. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, uh, thank you for your time today. <coughs> Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, we have uh, three votes uh, that have just been called for, and uh, we have no further questions for you. However, we must tell you we appreciate uh, your expertise and your testimony today. It's been very, very helpful, and uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you.